Hi everyone. Um, waiting for the, my MC to start. I mean, uh, notice um, given that Willy is online and he is the first going. I don't know if you want to check the the lights we've got just to make sure. If you want to flicker through them quickly, I can give you the presenter role. Yeah, sure. Let's give it a go. Oh yeah, these are the ones I uploaded, right? Yeah. Yeah, cool. I didn't um I didn't change them, so that should be fine. Uh, what do I have to do? Can you see the red pointer that I'm moving? Yeah. On? Okay, perfect. And if I were, I just click next, go to the next slide. Great picture. All right, cool. Seems to work. How do I give it back to you? Or shall I keep it? Uh, you can keep it where I run the introduction and hi right. by the way. <laughs> can you claim it back if you need to? I don't have to do anything to give it you back, right? No, 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 I'll do that. It's Perfect. Easy right. peasy. Thanks. <laughs> I'll mute myself. Actually, I should check my camera as well, I suppose, so you can see my mug. Um... Is that working? Yeah. Perfect. Mm. It's stupid, right? I've got a, a laptop and both the webcam and the microphone are broken on it. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to have external everything, and then of course you have to change the defaults every single time you do anything. No, it works. Good. I try, yeah. I think I give it a couple of minutes more. We start. Yeah, three. yeah, it's the first one of the day, right? That's right. Yeah.
Right. So people are starting to join. I think it's uh, 3 p.m. sharp here in the UK. So I think it's a time to start. First and foremost, I would like to um, say uh, thank you very much for joining the VFIU IMMU PCI and um, micro conference today. I will give a very, very short introduction first and then hand over to the speakers because, I mean, we have a packed schedule, very interesting topics this year, so it's better to, to start as promptly as possible. Um, first off, I would like to take thanks uh, our uh, sponsors, uh, Diamond Sponsor Facebook, Platinum Sponsor IBM, Gold Sponsor RM Microsoft, Silver Sponsors AWS, Netflix and Red Hat, Speaker Gift Sponsor Collabora, T-Shirt Sponsor VMware, and Conference Services Linux Foundation and the service they provide to run the conference. Thank you very much to them all. Of course, we are running a conference in a friendly manner and uh, I wish we can run it smoothly. Well, here is the policy that uh, should be, well, taken into account to, to participate in this conference. I'm pretty sure I will make sure that we adhere to it and uh, we work towards that. Uh, well, respecting the code of conduct that the News Foundation put forward. So, um, Housekeeping, whenever you not presenting, I mean, uh, keep your microphone and camera muted and uh, when non participating. If you want to ask questions, I mean, it's up to every speaker to decide how questions can be asked. They can be asked through shared notes in the presentation here on VBB or by enabling your webcam and then, well, a presenter can uh, hand over to you and ask you to unmute to ask that question. I, I will leave it to presenters to make that decision. I mean, whenever you start the presentation, just please explain how you prefer to take uh, questions if you want to take questions, otherwise you can take them at the end. Um, and I would also like to thank the LPC 2021 Planning Committee. I think they did an amazing job again this year. I mean, uh, for organizing everything and setting up this virtual platform. Hopefully it's gonna be the last virtual conference and next year we'll be able to run this in person. But anyway, I think it's a very um, nice platform that allows us to run this Microsoft's micro conference all together. And well, I um, want to thank them all uh, for organizing it again this year. I'm looking forward to next year as well. Um, we are not on a break, uh, just, uh, um, to start with, uh, before starting the micro conference, uh, well, I would like to thank uh, um, Alex, Bjorn, and Jörg for co organizing it, and in particular, uh, Christoph, because, uh, well, thank you for showing up and thank you for organizing everything. I mean, he, he may have become a familiar name with you, I mean, in, uh, between the conference speakers. And uh, because I think he did an amazing job, I mean, this micro conference wouldn't be possible without your help. And I want to thank you very much uh, to, uh, today for the organization. Thank you very much for what you did to make this happen. Uh, before handing over to Will for the first presentation today, I want to mention that it's a mixture of um, FBFIO, IMMU, and PCI topics. That's for time and logistic requirements. So I think you can see that we'll go back and forth between, for instance, PCI and IMMU topics, but that's what we can do in terms of logistic. The schedule is quite packed, so please be aware of your allocated time slot. Uh, well, uh, you're all experienced speakers, uh, so I mean, uh, I'll have to stop you if you overrun. The idea is, as usual in Plumbers, we are presenting very technical topics, short introduction, followed by a discussion. Most likely we'll not be able to solve the problem within the time slot we are allocated. If you cannot solve it there, I mean, follow up is in, in ACK rooms. The most important bit is getting the point across. So let's not delve too much into the introduction. Let's get to the discussion as quickly as we can. Um, we have, uh, of course, a, a, spa, a published schedule. I will stick to it and I really mean it because it's important for everyone to take part into the micro conference, first of all, for synchronization and also for the breaks. It's very important to have breaks. So, I mean, I, I will 
uh, stick to those breaks as they're planned. And in order to do that, and we do have any further ado, I will, I will hand over to Will for the first presentation today. And uh, let's get this started. And thank you very much, everyone, to, for joining. All right, thank you very much, Lorenzo. And um, uh, can you all hear me? Yeah, I give you the presenter role, and I think you should yeah. be all set now. All right, cool. Feel free to go. I'm just waiting for it to show up. Yeah, I still don't have it, Lorenzo. Well, while I wait to get presenter mode. Um, oh, there we are, it showed up, perfect. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me in the uh, microconference because this talk is about these things called page-based hardware attributes, which some of you might be aware of, some of you probably aren't, so I'm gonna describe it assuming no prior knowledge. But it's not really VFIO, IMMU, or PCI specific. It kind of touches on all of them, but it's, uh, yeah, thank you for giving me a home for this talk because it didn't fit anywhere else in the schedule. Um, so let's get cracking. So I want to give an introduction, like normally I wouldn't do this at Plumbers, uh, but I think it helps to give some background as to why me and why I'm interested in this topic and why I kind of, I, I need some help because I don't know how to solve this problem. Um, so I'm an active upstream kernel developer, I'm Will, and I, the, one of the main things I do, the biggest thing is co-maintain the ARM64 architecture with Catalin, who I think is, is on the, the call as well. Um, I work at Google in the Android systems team, so we're responsible for over 3 billion devices. Uh, and we're responsible for them in the sense that we, we maintain and develop this Android common kernel, which is essentially a kernel tree, which you can use to build Android products with. And we are SOC agnostic in this team. We don't just work on a specific SOC or for a specific OEM. We work with everyone trying to make an Android device. And therefore we get some visibility into upcoming SOC designs. And because we're upstream first, uh, we can sometimes get an idea of, oh, SOCs are going in this direction and Linux kind of doesn't have any support for that. What might it look like? And these page-based hardware attributes are really, they fall into that category. Um, we do have some active engagements with the ARM architecture, but as you'll see, that hasn't helped that much for this specific problem. So I said I'd uh, assume no prior knowledge. So I'm gonna give a quick recap. Um, lots of details omitted, but to set the scene. So this is, this is kind of what the ARM64 MMU looks like. And the CPU and the SMMU, which is what they call their IMMU, are, are basically the same. Like they, they have the same table format and things like that, same kind of procedure. So these green boxes represent different exception levels. So EL0 is user space, EL1 is kernel, EL2 is hypervisor, it's more privilege. And in this sort of light blue box I've got here, um, you've got user space and kernel, and when they emit memory accesses, when they load and store data, they'll do that using virtual addresses, right? So those virtual addresses, these VAs, come out into the stage one MMU, which reads the stage one page tables, uh, which are owned by the kernel, and they're used to translate that virtual address into an intermediate physical address, which is this IPA, which comes out the other end. And then this IPA is used as input to a stage two MMU, uh, conceptually. And that reads a stage two page table that's owned by the hypervisor. Um, and then that translates the intermediate physical address into a physical address. And that the physical address that you get out at the end of that is actually what's used to go and index caches. It's used as a, you know, put on the bus as a transaction to go and actually get some memory. Uh, so the page tables here are used for address translation, but also, you know, normal permission checking, read only, execute never, things like that, and memory attributes. And that's quite crucial to this talk. So memory attributes might be things like, uh, is this a cacheable access? It might be things like, um, is this a shareable access? You know, does it need to be coherent with other CPUs? Um, those sorts of things are encoded in the memory attributes, which come in by the page tables. And I should say, uh, in terms of um, asking questions, please do just shout. Um, you can, it's easier if you put your video on, but don't let that stop you. I, I, people need to understand the problem, otherwise we're, it's gonna be silence at the end. So please do shout if I don't make any sense. So then this sort of abstracted view, rough overview of the ARM64 page table format, uh, again, this, this box down the bottom is now this SMMU, or sorry, this MMU could be the SMMU. So that's doing your stage one and stage two. The virtual address goes in, it either faults or it emits a bus transaction. Um, and when it goes and reads the page table, it roughly gets this sort of information out of the page table. So whether it's valid, the output address, um, which for the full translation is going to be the physical address, uh, some permissions that I mentioned earlier, the attributes that I mentioned earlier on, and this mysterious thing at the top, uh, called PBHA, page-based hardware attributes. 
Now, these are four bits, I think, uh, if I can remember that correctly, in the page table. And they are not used or interpreted by the MMU in any way. Uh, these, these four bits are basically just taken from the page table and emitted directly out as part of the bus transaction. So assuming you don't fault, you get your physical address, your attributes that I mentioned, and then these mysterious four bits just get put on the end of the transaction. Um, so what are they for if the MMU is not actually interpreting them? Well, we can look at the Arman, and uh, if you've ever read the Arman, it's all kind of written like this. So it says when PBHA is enabled, then hardware can use that PBHA bit because you can actually enable it on a per bit basis, but assume they're all enabled. So it can use those bits for capital letters, implementation defined purposes. And then there's some spiel about how if they're zero, it's kind of the same as if they're disabled. Um, but what this means is those, those bits that end up going out on the bus, those weird four bits, do some weird implementation defined thing that even ARM haven't specified what it does. It's up to the SOC integrator what that actually, what, in, what impact that has on your system. So unsurprisingly, we disable this upstream, right? Because we have no idea what these, these bits do. So yeah, implementation defined means we have no idea what they do. I mean, you know, halt and catch fire could be one of the encodings. I've got a bunch of questions here um, because trying to find out what people are building, what people think is reasonable to support, what isn't reasonable to support, what could they be used for? I'm gonna come back to this at the end. Uh, I've only got a couple more slides. So I would like to give an example of uh, how they might be used in the modern SOC to kind of do something useful. So an example of how they might be used, uh, here is a, um, that's not even an SOC diagram, right? it's just a block diagram showing part of an SOC or an, an overall image. So on the, on the left-hand side, I've got these standard RMIP blocks, so CPUs and some caches up here. So it's interesting, actually, the PBHA bits don't form part of the physical tag in the, the caches. So if you have two accesses which are translated and got to, to aliases of a page or a cache line, um, and they have different PBHA bits, they'll still hit in the cache that the PBHA bit is not taken into account for, for the tags. Um, on the IMMU side, over on the other side of the diagram, uh, the SMMU actually overrides the PBHA bits. So the DMA master might decide to stick some out, but they're going to get overridden by the SMMU. It can put whatever it likes in there. And that's, again, programmed from the page tables. So the transaction comes out, uh, goes onto the interconnect, that propagates those bits. And in this example here, uh, there's this thing called a system level cache in SLC. This is quite popular in, in more modern ARM64 SOCs. And this is essentially an, an invisible cache, uh, is, is one way of explaining it. It's a cache that lives right before DRAM, so it kind of looks like it's next to the memory controller from a software perspective. But no one, no one accesses memory downstream of that, um, so therefore it's able to cache all transactions. It can, it can buffer everything before the, before the memory controller. And you then you might be able to use these PBHA bits to influence how that SLC uh, behaves. So, for example, you might be able to put performance hints in there. Um, you might be able to put prefetch hints in there and control how a prefetcher is going to to start prefetching data into the SLC based on some access patterns. Uh, you might be able to influence caching policy beyond the allocation hints that the architecture provides. So for things like uh, eviction policy, you might be able to control um, with these PBHA bits. Uh, quality of service, so whether something is it's high priority or low priority, or whether something should be you know, only access certain sets in the cache, for example, the geometry of the cache. And then um, perhaps most uh, scary of all, you might use them to actually influence the format in which the data is stored in the cache. Um, that's quite scary because if you have different aliases accessing the same page uh, with different PBHA bits, you can have loss of coherence if the data format is different depending on which one hits. So they're not part of the tag. So you, you, could, you could run into some quite worrying problems with that last data format one. So if we were to take that SLC uh, example that I just gave, what would it take to support it in Linux and what are the sort of problems we run into? Um, so one is that the ARM architecture is actually, it's very vague as I showed you about what these things do. It doesn't even specify how the stage one and the stage two interact. If you remember there's two page tables, one owned by the kernel and one owned by the hypervisor. Uh, they both have PBHA bits. The architecture doesn't define how they get combined. Um, you have to go and see what your specific CPU does. I think most of them take the ones from the hypervisor in preference to the ones from the kernel. So stage two overrides. But again, like that's, that's really difficult for Linux because it means we have to enable this on a CPU, a CPU basis. Um, although it's four bits in the page table, you don't know how many bits are actually supported by the CPU and there's no way of probing that. So we need to know that somehow as well. And no ID register tells you that. As I said, the for data format changes appear to be infeasible. Um, 
you'd need to make sure that all virtual aliases uh, somehow efficiently do this uh, are congruent. They all agree on the, the PBHA bits. And that's not just within the kernel, that's user space, that's kernel, that's hypervisor, potentially firmware and, and secure side as well. And if you have a presence of a cacheable alias with incorrect bits, like the linear mapping, perhaps, some, perhaps something could go wrong there with speculative fills, I don't know. Um, but the performance hits, I think, look a lot more tractable. Yeah, we would need a firmware description to say how these bits are encoded. Uh, we would require them, I think, to be static. You wouldn't want you know, encoding OXF to mean one thing when you boot the system and then a day later to mean something else based on, I don't know, firmware changing its mind. You'd want them to be static, to be assigned. If you wanted to use them for drivers, which is uh, quite a common yeah, use I've seen, where you want, essentially, you know you're interacting with a certain device, you want to program up the SMU in a certain way and the CPU in another way um, with these different PBHA bits, uh, you could possibly do it with DMA Atra, but it does end up looking very opaque because we don't know sort of how do you how do you name those things? You end up with things like DMA Atra PBHA 0000, DMA Atra PBHA 0001 as these hash defines. It's it's not great to read. It's also per page mapping, right? So they call them page-based hardware attributes, but it's not per physical page, it's per the mapping. And it's also not per transaction. So things like performance hits are a little weird because you're saying this buffer that I'm mapping, I'm mapping it. So that you know this part of it needs to be streaming, or this part of it needs to be higher higher priority than this other part. But it's not done on a per transaction basis. So you would probably want a mechanism to be able to remap your DMA buffer, um, the same memory but with different PBHA bits. And it's not clear whether we need this only for these sort of driver cases, or whether we also need it for anonymous memory, for example, whether you want to allow uh, anonymous mmap or mprotect to be able to change these bits for user space mappings. For QoS, in terms of partitioning, maybe do it with res control, but again, it's all opaque, so I don't know. And I'd be keen to hear of any practical use cases that I've missed that people know about or are interested in. And I think that's all I have. So how do we fix this? I'm not quite sure how to support it, um, but I do know that SOCs are building this. Um, it is being used for some of the sort of things I've outlined here. I'm not sure how to really go about getting Linux ready for this. And I'll go back to some of the questions I had before just to try and prompt some discussion, but I'm keen to hear from other people who either know about this or have thought about it or where do we draw the line? So thank you. That's kind of the outline of the problem. I've been in a number of conversations on the Intel side for the, the, P, the TPH bits in PCIe, which mm -hmm. are very similar. They're very implementation defined and Every SOC, you know, has a particular take on how they, how they work and what they should do, and we've wanted to see it exposed in Linux. Um, one of the SOCs I'm familiar with is using those bits to target the, um, basically, kind of you said cache sets, very similar to that. So, so where right. where the, the where the physical cache exists on the SOC, and there's reasons why certain memory DMA flow should go to certain cache areas or not. Yeah. Uh, but we so want is to that done, Jason, is that done on a per transaction basis? So TPH bits in PCIe are per transaction basis. Okay, yeah, so um, it's a, and, that's a cru crucial difference to how so well, the way it's designed here, right? Yeah, it, and I think it's an, an ARM philosophy versus an Intel philosophy because right. Intel often tends to put things on per transaction basis, and ARM often puts things into the into the page tables. And I, I'd be interested if there's some sense of harmony here, it, like what happens to TPH bits in an ARM SOC, like the one that I know of they're being used like your PBHA bits are being used where they come into the internal interconnect. Uh, <laughs> and we probably don't have PBHA on this hardware at all. So yeah. I, I view them as very, very similar. Um, other yeah, than That's interesting actually what you said because the, the SMMU has no provision for passing the bits through. So it always overrides them with the page table. Um, uh, I was just looking at no snoop and I wonder if it would be similar, like the, mm -hmm. the no snoop bit coming in from a TLP on PCI overrides the cacheability bits in the mem after on ARM. And mm -hmm. I wonder if ARM would do a similar thing with PBHA and the THP bits. Yeah, let me make a note to look to follow that up. THP. TPH, sorry. TPH. TPH. But at least from a kernel perspective, I think if a device driver wants to use SOC specific transaction hints, either encoded in the page table or carried from the DMA originating at the mm -hmm. device, that's where we need, I think, an infrastructure. Yeah, I agree. Um, 
so what else have we got? Peter says, do you have an example of an SOC that implements these things? And do we know what they actually do there? So the, the example I gave for the, uh, I mean, I know it was a bit high level. Um, so this one with the, the system level cache. So using this for, um, uh, for, for controlling the caching policy. So it's in a way which doesn't, um, doesn't break coherency. Uh, I've seen that sort of thing being done. So you can, you can influence, you know, the behavior of the SLC, but not in a way that's visible outside of just performance changes. I will. Uh, hey, Kathleen. Yeah, that's what I've seen internally as well on using the, the PBHA to drive some cache allocation uh, in the system level cache. So still be fully coherent. So we don't have a problem with that. It's just that some of the accesses would avoid polluting the, the system level cache. Mm -hmm. And from this perspective, it's not too bad. In terms of the DMA API, I thought we would add some maybe device tree only without could add some DMA attribute, custom attribute one, custom attribute two, whatever. And you have a corresponding uh, bit value in, uh, uh, in DT. And we just map to those, but that assumes that it doesn't break coherency. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that that's probably one of the, um, it's, it's a line that I think we need to draw, which is, uh, in the face of mismatched aliases, so two virtual aliases which differ on PBHA bits, do we require coherency? And I think if we say yes, then it makes this problem much more tractable. If we say no, then I, I don't know necessarily how to address that. I mean, it's better to, you probably heard from more people than me on what they use this for, so get in touch with them and ask them. And just, we propose some patch set on the list and get them to comment. If they keep quiet, then yeah, we don't support the feature at all. No, I agree. Um, and I mean, part of me speaking here today is because I have been obviously <laughs> talking to, to silicon vendors and I'm aware of some of these things that are going on because because I'm um, just say implementation defined, it's kind of a bit of a free for all. So it's how do we rein that in in a way that we can support it in Linux? Because getting rid of all the aliases, uh, is it, I mean, it's even just within the kernel, it's a pretty expensive thing to do. It looks like it looks yeah. like the swap out path, pretty much. The DMA API would have to unmap the pages from the linear map. Yeah, yeah, you end up going through the R map code or something like that to to go and find all the the mappings of that page. Well, not necessarily. Well, yeah, maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. I think it depends on the other question. It depends on speculative. Like, is a speculative access allowed to cause a problem? And probably, if it's caches, like it probably can. No, no, it depends. If if it's a driver, and let's say a graphics driver that allocates some memory, and it wants to access it, not people do the system level cache. <clears throat> uh, that's one thing. So the driver is in control of what that's true. Uh, what it allocates. But if you have some random, as you mentioned, you them anonymous maps that one wants to or change some of the or whatever you want to do, change the format in the in the cache. Well, then that gets a bit more complicated to to sort out and avoid the yeah. the aliases. Yeah, you end up. I think you end up with something like a, <clears throat> well, it's awful. You have to extend get user page basically to uh, like the GUP code. You have to take the PBHA bits that it needs, and then it has to find all the aliases. <laughs> it just sounds, you know, a million years later when it comes back. It... Does the secret MFD thing help uh, with the, the infrastructure that it has to unmap it from the linear map? I, I don't know. And it's not just the linear map though, it's also user space, right? So. Yeah. Um, at least for an API, the, the use cases I've seen, at least in the server area, tend to revolve around NUMA effects. Like, uh, you know, I'd like to allocate some memory on my local NUMA node, and I would like to tell the device to DMA into that memory, and I would like it if the device, you know, the whole the whole SOC under me targets the DMAs to land in my local NUMA cache. I don't know if that's what you're seeing in other vendors, but that's definitely kind of my thinking what this is being used for, what I see. 
Yeah, that's an that's one I haven't got. So I mean, obviously, the, I'm from the Android background, so we don't have the the big Numa things. But um, that's uh, I can see PBHA is not limited to Android, so I could see it being used for that as well. So I'll mention that. Thank you. All right. What else do we have? We've got a few more minutes. Um, Nurse mic is broken. Um, so there's a conversation between Nur and Mark. Uh, I don't know, Mark, do you want to talk about that? Well, it was just uh, Nur did seem to think that firmware could somehow define what these bits were meant for. But uh, my understanding is that this this is baked in the hardware and not something that software can control in any way. Oh, other than setting them or clearing them. Um, yeah, I suppose. So firmware would have to advertise, or DT, like as Kathleen said, would have to advertise uh, to the kernel. You know, you these are the these are the bits encodings that you have. Um, I guess assume that they're the same across Big Little because it but, doesn't they're thinking about otherwise. <laughs> but then I don't know, I don't know how a driver would pick that up. But also associate the semantic. That's exactly yeah right. So uh, yeah, maybe yeah. maybe you'd have to name them or something, which is pretty yeah, hard. I mean, that, that's, that's would have to say find the find the one that means high priority, and it goes, oh, that's you know E, <laughs> and then you yeah. you but go and use that. Also, uh, find the one that is safe, for example, for uh, running a guest, for example, because mm -hmm. the lack of definition of what these bits, I mean, how these bits are combined between stage one and stage two, <clears> I mean. At the, I mean, today, I strictly have no idea how a guest can potentially exploit that against the host. It's, mm. it's mind-boggling. I think that means more generally that we cannot support any system where these bits potentially result in loss of coherency, even ignoring the idea of whoever drivers can use them because of potentially malicious guest that exists. Yeah, if, if I mean, I think most CPUs do like stage two overrides. So if if we could get if that ended up being you know we 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 require that for Linux, then at least a guest malicious guest would be out of the picture. I think. Sure. But it sounds like there's not much of an appetite to uh, to support uh, the loss of coherence case. I don't think we, unless the memory allocated is controlled by the driver, but even at that point, it's not. No, but that's fair, yeah. actually. So you could, yeah, you could have some um... survey of what people use it for. We try to push this internally through the architects to clarify the meaning here and uh, what people are allowed to do and not to do. Mm -hmm. We didn't have much success, at least enforcing not breaking coherence here. Yeah, but I think what you yeah, said was fair. Like having a to... having an allocator, like a, a DMA buff allocator or something, which could dish out, you know, a bit like carve out memory. You you could have some memory which you know that you don't have an alias of, and you know that you're going to have these bits. So that that might be doable for for coherent DMA allocations. Yeah, but yeah, streaming DMA. That's, that's mm -hmm. The ability to this kind of DMA, not yeah. yeah getting ch changing the attributes of user mappings okay anyway, cool you ran out of time i'm out time? of time yeah um so lorenzo thank you very much thanks for everyone who joined in that's given me some food for thought um if you want to follow up with me offline uh i think it's willowkernel.org i think i had it on the first slide I think uh, Will wanted to mention something that the challenge there is probably also to to map those attributes to something that is common for the kernel. I suppose is something that yeah. every platform should define. And but having a base use model for the kernel to say these specific flags and then map those bits to those flags to make sure that we can use them. Maybe it's something that uh, a way forward. Well, I understand it, what you presented, but well, that's the challenge probably yeah i mean we need a way that drivers can portably inter interact with these things across different socs uh, and not have to say am i on this soc oh i need to use this encoding oh am i on this one i need to use this encoding 
Uh, yeah, I mean, just saying that what for Linux those class classes mean and then map those bits to those and see if we can use them or not. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I suspect what will happen, but well. Cool, well, thank you very much. I don't want to eat into the next uh, the next bit. So um, I will stop. And like I said, please follow up if there was something um, you want to tell me about use cases or something you missed or you think of a question afterwards that you didn't have time to answer. So cheers. Thank you very much, Will. Thank you very much, everyone uh, who took part. I mean, we, have a five minute, five minute break now and we restarted, um, well, in five minutes. And um, thank you very much with Jonathan presentation. Okay, so this next talk is gonna be on a, a stack of different elements. And to be honest, it's not a perfect plumber's talk because what we actually have here is a series of different topics that are all closely related, each of which has a pile of questions. So we'll probably end up with a short intro, some time to talk about something, another short intro, some time to talk about something, and inevitably we'll run out. And in fact, I'll just stop my stopwatch. So why are we discussing these topics at all? So DOE, and I'll come on to the details of what that is in a minute, um, is necessary for CXL 2.0 enablement, particularly to access a sort of device provided table, looks a bit like an ACPI table called CDAT. Um, CMA itself is likely to start appearing on devices fairly soon. On top of that, both PCIe and CXL IDE, which is a form of link encryption, um, is likely to also appear fairly soon. Um, and one other thing here is it is actually quite useful to prove out what we've done in the DOE implementation using several different protocols. There were some open questions on when we first did CDAT um, that were best resolved by just doing a few more. Um, as we went through this process, it turned out there were an awful lot of unknowns and hence plumbers seemed the obvious choice. So as I mentioned, uh, this set of slides are going to, or oh, this session in, this microconference is going to be a little unusual in the sense that it's going to be looking at a stack of different elements. Uh, there are questions in all layers. Um, I've gone with this green colouring to indicate slides on which I'm expecting questions. By, by all means, jump in with questions on other slides. Um, as I put in the chat a moment ago, I've got a slightly precarious arrangement for reading the chat. So definite preference for audio if possible, um, or if anyone else can shout out if there's a particularly interesting question popped up in the chat. Um, yeah, not sure how far we'll get, but hopefully at least slide eight. Um, there are quite a few slides, um, many of which I don't actually intend to get to. They're there for sort of background information if people want to look at them later. I'm going to start at the low level and then sort of build up the stack so that hopefully we can make some progress, even if we don't get all components in place anytime soon. I'm going to try and avoid actually too much discussion of any code or indeed specifications mostly because we've only got 45 minutes. Um, there are interesting little nuggets in there, interesting corner cases that do need discussion, but that's probably better done on the mailing list. I will add that use cases for this are also very much of interest. Um, particularly, do we actually want to support all of this in the kernel? Is it worth bothering from a maintenance point of view, or is it actively a bad idea? Um, I'd be interested to hear anyone's thoughts on that as we go. So, an introduction. Um, it's a stack of different components. So at the bottom end, we've got PCI Express and particularly this entity called a data object exchange uh, capability, which hides in config space. And that provides a sort of mailbox based transport uh, for query response type protocols. Um, one of those is CDAT, which I mentioned a minute ago, which is a table used particularly by CXL, although it is more general. Um, then on top of, yeah, another DOE protocol is CMA, which we will cover rather extensively uh, later in this. Um, and that's known as component measurement and authentication. And that provides a DOE transport uh, for uh, the security protocol and data model, SPDM, uh, which we'll also touch on. Um, the other one that I've put on here, but don't intend to spend a lot of time talking about unless anyone wants to jump in on it, is Integrity and Data Encryption, IDE. This is link encryption, and also there's a thing called selective encryption that lets you do point to point through switches on PCI Express, um, particularly for things like peer-to-peer. -peer. You can route the data between two devices 
and encrypt it in, on the link in between them. Um, if anyone is interested in kernel managed IDE, please uh, shout out because it would be useful to identify who cares um, so that we can have some more discussions about that at some later date. So topic number one, the DOE. The PCI SIG ECN uh, for this defines a mailbox interface in an extended capability in PCI um, config space. There's an in FIFO and an out FIFO, both 32 bits, uh, so one D word each. And for the in one, you just write to it, D word off, D word off, D word, um, to get a whole message in. Um, for the out one, it's a little more fiddly. It's a read from it and then write anything to it just to acknowledge that you've read the previous value. There's an interrupt um, for things like, is there a response ready, uh, error conditions, and a slightly odd one, which is no longer busy, but we won't touch too much on that today, but the handling is a bit strange for that. Um, it's kind of hard to have an interrupt for something is no longer the case, and you can't tell whether it ever was the case, but you have an interrupt. So it's a little bit strange. Um, this uh, ECN includes a protocol format uh, for what's known as the discovery protocol, uh, which is kind of crucial because the only way of finding out what the DOE mailbox is for, and you can have multiple instances of these per PCI function, um, is to use the discovery protocol. Now, as we'll come on to, the problem with the discovery protocol is you can break anything else that's going on at the same time, because you can read someone else's data, for instance. Um, each DOE, DOE instance can support uh, multiple protocols. Um, there are restrictions in some of the other specifications that specify individual protocols. For instance, uh, CMA and IDE can share a DOE um, instance, but you can't have anything else on that one. The protocols are effectively labeled by vendor ID and a data object type, which means that vendors get to define their own, which is always fun. And we'll get some questions on that a bit later. Okay. Um, and as I say, yes, other published specifications define some protocols. So this is the set we have to look at today when considering how this stuff works. There are other protocols. Um, some of them are vendor specific and some of them are in various organizations and not yet published, so we can't talk about them. So this is our first issue and it comes in several different forms. There is no way in the way that the hardware works for DOE to do mediation. So if there's more than one piece of software wanting to talk to this DOE instance, they can trample on each other. There's no convenient, I've claimed the DOE flag or anything like that. Um, they may be used by any of, and this is a part of the list, the kernel, user space, a hypervisor, uh, trusted execution environment, so something like TrustZone might use them, uh, firmware in the system, others you can have slightly interesting channels from secure elements and things that we'll talk over the PCI bus to these. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, by the time we know what a DOE supports, it could already be too late. We could already have broken someone else using it. Um, so we can't do any decisions for who has control of a DOE simply based on what it supports. And as I mentioned uh, CDAT earlier, for instance, the expectation is that firmware might use that during a sort of cold boot situation, but the software model based on CXL at the moment for that will use it um, from the OS kernel. Um, and as I say, if we want to know it's a DOE mailbox, we've just killed IDE, broken the encryption and made the device die. So it's not helpful. This Jonathan so, is because, sorry, um, is because discovering the protocol use the same mechanism as yeah. the protocol themselves, right? Absolutely, yes. Thanks, Lorenzo. That's Thank you. Yeah. Uh, clarification. So step one, which is kind of the easy one. So I thought we'd start with the, the what I think is the soft question. So we have had discussions about the fact that given these protocols can be defined by vendors, there is an argument for giving user space access to them. Um, there might not be a kernel driver for some types of components, particularly CXL devices can, um, particularly CXL1, for instance, can be set up by firmware and then the OS just doesn't do anything at all with them. They're just memory uh, from the point of view of how they're used. Um, but they could, in theory, have DOE instances. Um, and there are other types of protocol where it definitely makes sense to expose them to user space. 
So we need to mediate between anything accessing them from user space and any kernel accesses so that again, we don't trample on top of each other and end up corrupting each other's data streams. And there's certainly no reliable way we can build the kernel such that it's hardened against bad implementations in user space um, if we expose it to both of them directly. So option one for this is that the kernel implements protocol support for any protocol we're going to deal with. Um, then on a per protocol basis, we might have a user space interface. Um, CDAT's an example. For that, we just had a table dump type interface similar to the ACPI sort of debugging and the ability just to dump a table as a binary, which is quite helpful for debugging. Um, option two would be that the kernel would provide some generic access uh, for some protocols. So the RFC or one version of the RFC includes um, an IOCTL type interface where you can go, here's a query, put the response here, run that. Um, whether we want to do that, because we get into interesting questions of if we provide this access to user space and then we do something in the kernel later, there are cases in some of the protocols where there are sequences of query responses that have to occur in the same order, or you can successfully corrupt yourself. Um, and another option is that we may have a, a sort of optionality to this. The kernel sometimes, in some sense, binds to a DOE and indicates that. Um, if that happens and we're not, oh, sorry, if that doesn't happen and hence we are not bound to it, do we need to prevent user space access or do we need to allow user space access? Kind of an open question. Um, and the sort of final open question on this one is that protocols can be defined by vendors. So the usual vendor defined element, how nice should we be as the kernel community in enabling vendor defined protocols without them putting them in the kernel? So on that note, do we have any sort of feedback? Uh, we have a question from Ashok. Um, DOE, uh, has just what does DOE have just one outstanding message at a time, or can it take multiple commands and responses? It's actually a slightly interesting question. Per protocol, it's only allowed to have one query response going at a time. But if you implement multiple protocol, the specification allows for you to have multiple query responses going on different protocols simultaneously. Now, so far in the kernel support, we've decided that there isn't really a strong use case for that. Um, and it doesn't half make the implementation more complex. So it's a kind of we'll we'll solve it when it's um, when it's necessary and not any earlier. So Jason's asked the, the good question, which is, is there any chance to go back and fix the spec and maybe add some form of hardware based sort of mediation in this space? The answer to that is we can't fix the DOE spec as has been issued, which unfortunately means that people are making hardware. Um, none of it's out there yet, but we unfortunately are a little bit late to do anything about it. We absolutely can have inputs to future versions of the specification. Um, and should we say, having identified some of these issues, I have had some feedback from people involved with the spec process, which is they would like more involvement from the kernel community. Um, at an earlier stage to catch these things. Um, lessons learned, perhaps. So anyone got a view on any of these options? It My current preference like is one. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. No, I was going to say, it sounds like for some of the things like you mentioned, like IDE, we are likely to want to use that in the kernel at some point or other because of things like protecting against external Thunderbolt stuff and whatever. Yep. That's a good point. Um, I've got a, some suggestions on that on uh, the next. Oh, OK, sorry, there's a very brief slide that just says it is justifying the fact that we will want to use these things in the kernel. Um, this is just a bunch of use cases, so I'll skip over that in the interests of time. So this is the next question is if we've got other software entities, kernel user space is kind of easy because, to be honest, we effectively control it. Um, the problem we get is when things like trusted execution environments are involved. Now, for this, they may be chatting away to the thing. And at the moment, we can't, as a kernel people, rely on the fact that they aren't. And that's a bit of a problem. 
Um, it's quite a big problem. We can't get away with the kind of obvious solution, which would be to put a, a DSM in ACPI. Um, so this is just a query to the firmware that basically says, give me some magic property, and it's GUID indexed. So we could, in theory, add one of those. The problem being that we also need to support hot plug. And DSDT, where the DSM would be, uh, would not, um, but doesn't perceive, it doesn't understand the concept of devices that weren't there when it was created. It's not a dynamically updated table. Um, well, if, if it's hot plug, is there any chance that it's actually being used by the firmware? Yes, <laughs> there are definitely models where that happens and it gets a little bit exciting, to put it lightly. Um, a lot of this, I, I will touch on the fact there is stuff that we cannot discuss at this point. Um, so this sort of, that sort of question should get clarified in specifications that will be forthcoming. Um, so we may well want to talk about those next year or possibly sometime in the meantime. Um, I did raise the question at the bottom here. I've got some suggestions for how we might work around this, but um, I would add that in the meantime, we may need to just use something horrendous like an allow list or kernel parameters that say, for instance, this one here is CDAT. There's no way we can trample on firmware if we're reading CDAT. Um, so we may need those sort of options to get us going. Agreed with Bok, so yes, his microphone's died. Um, so a couple of quick suggestions this. I don't want to go into this in depth because honestly we'll rat hole badly on options of how to do things in ACPI. Uh, I noted earlier actually, I only care about ACPI, but obviously there would be other firmware stories for this or other methods needed. We could get away with in the short term a system-wide DSM, which just basically says the firmware does perceive or does understand uh, DOEs, it's going to provide a firmware specific interface to talk to them and all the mediation is actually going to be done in some firmware element it's a big hammer doesn't work in all cases the hot plug case is um, interesting for that um, given that the firmware possibly doesn't even know the hot plugs occurred depending on exactly what model you use there are other options we could do something similar to is done for fit which is a, a technique used for updating NFIT, which is an NB DIM uh, related ACPI table. And what that does is it adds a method which you can query at runtime that gives you back a buffer. Inside that buffer, you then have some descriptive table elements that tell you current state. That, that can be magically routed through to memory somewhere that's been filled in by someone. Um, and you can take ages to reply to that. So you can go out and ask some management controller and have it come back and fill the buffer in. It's not a trivial spec change, but we probably do need to try and get something in place in, in the space. And I propose we do something code first. So hopefully we can get good agreement amongst the, the kernel community and other operating systems on what this would look like um, before we get into the, the games of actually getting it in a published spec, which can take a lot longer. else in the chat at the moment uh any other comments on this before we move on to so for the for the question between user space interfaces and kernel interfaces um if there are vendor specific extensions then i think we'll have to do a user space interface and we have other subsystems like i squared c or usb that do have methods of uh, um, allowing and disallowing user space access to devices based on what the what other drivers are bound to the kernel and i think we can just duplicate whatever is done there i wonder if we want to go that route or or go for effectively option two here where we we provide a very tightly controlled interface so that you could talk particularly if you've got a an instance where one of it, it's supporting say CDAT, because you can combine anything with CDAT, there's no rules in that spec, um, and a vendor defined protocol. So you'd need to do the mediation there just to make sure that you, you do your queuing and interrupt handling and everything. So we might be better off always binding to a DOE, but providing um, char dev with a IOCTL. Yeah, I didn't quite understand how it works if there's multiple protocols, like how the 
kernel would arbitrate between those. It sounded a bit like every single protocol could be modeled as a read write type interface, not even IO control. So you can just read and write and pass pass down this the data stream to user space that way per protocol. But if that's not possible then you you could there's a few things about indicating that you've finished. So right you need to write a certain amount of the the, the length of the record is protocol specific. So you, you almost need a how long is it uh field to be filled in. Um okay. which is a little bit fiddly. Well that, that is there's that's a length and read and write. So, yes, yeah you, you could define you, you, you could define a format to do it via read and write, absolutely. Yeah. That's certainly true. And if it's vendor specific, then the kernel wouldn't have an, any idea what how, how many bytes it needs. It has to come from user space anyway. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Couldn't couldn't the vendor protocols be put on a different mailbox? Ideally, yes. In practice, yeah. Mac doesn't say so. Okay. Well, I wish. I guess my <laughs> suggestion to vendors is put it on a different mailbox because if you you know, because then there then then it could be a different channel, so to speak. You've still got some slight problems around the discovery protocol. So if particularly if you've got a, mm -hmm. a generic class device that's supporting a vendor protocol. So you've got something like a CXL type three device, which is just a memory device, which is, is done as a class and has one unified driver, but you might have a, a vendor telemetry protocol or something, um, or I don't know, error reporting um, that you push out. Ideally, yeah, you'd have it on a, a different mailbox, but you'd still need to be able to say, you can't have it now because right now I'm doing the discovery protocol on it to find out whether it's my mailbox or yours. But yeah, it could be true. Mailbox. But the, but the kernels, the kernel mediation for that is easier, right? Kernel can enumerate those and then hand it off to user space by via some request. If yes. if the vendor really needs some user space direct access. Yes. I, uh, yeah, that true. that seems. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, thanks. Dan's just appearing. Hey, Dan. Any comments on this one, Dan, before we move on? Um, uh, did, did you already talk about the vendor specific part of it? We did talk a little bit about that and sort of ended up with the conclusion we'd need to provide some provision for it. And the, the point was just raised that it would be extremely helpful if it was a different mailbox. From it, it, would, it would be helpful if it was a different mailbox yeah, that that the kernel didn't own own at all. Um, yeah, the, the only thing I, the only thing I wanted to raise there was was the fact that like we have ACPI DSMs, and those are vendor specific. Any vendor can define them at any point in time, but we don't we don't give user space a generic way to issue any of them. We wrap kernel interfaces around them. So I. I I don't know if we want to let, or if, if it helps Linux to let vendors run wild with DOE interfaces versus like saying, no, you got to kind of follow protocols and publish them. And then of course Linux will support the, the published ones. Um, but yeah, if it's, on, if it's on its own DOE off in the corner, then maybe we can't enforce anything there. I mean, that might be an interesting policy to say that is if your protocol is going to share a DOE with one that the, is defined in a specification. Uh, then you've got to do that process. If it's an entirely separate one, then we can do the stuff that Ira just mentioned, where we just hive it off and go, nah, it's not ours. You do what you like with it. So that might work very well. Dan, you're saying that if it is um, if it is at least published, it's vendor specific, but if it is published, then it's okay for the kernel to support it. Yeah, I mean, it, like it, 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 it's, it's, as long as, I mean, it's basically a, can we point vendor two at vendor one's implementation and say, hey, vendor two, you're really doing the same thing as vendor one. Don't make an, don't invent something new. It's just it's trying. So it's not about it's not about in the standard or not. It's about trying to control unconstrained innovation. Correct. Uh, unconstrained uh, value add. Make sense. Jason just texted something interesting. He said, could Linux publish a generic protocol that could relate to user space and demand vendors implement it? Is there any chance the boat has sailed on that? Not totally sure how it yeah. would work, given that 
what you'd be trying to wrap up, given that we, these could be used for anything. Um, it would be extremely hard to define it cleanly. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to speak for Jason. I don't. I don't know if he wants to unmute and talk, but. Um, it sounds like you know we could just basically take some blob of data and pass it to the device. The device then decodes that blob and knows what to do with it. And we're really just providing a mailbox on a mailbox, which yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's. So I mean, my understanding is the spec here is kind of a little too general. Maybe like you said, you you have to do things in certain order and you have to follow certain rules theoretically. And I'm saying, let's just get rid of the theoretically and say, if you want to plumb to user space, you have to follow these rules and these rules eliminate the uncertainty so that the kernel can be a reliable transport for your data. Yes, you can't transport everything and you can't do every crazy thing you want to do, but you can do a lot, right? Basically fix the spec retroactively a little bit, at least for this use case. Yeah, I mean, there's one classic which I not mentioned in these slides, but um, DOE, has a wonderful definition that says it gives a load of detail on how you implement a query response protocol and then says and you may implement anything else you like well um, i mean that's what we can close off and say if you implement yeah, exactly. anything else you don't get user space access sorry i mean it sounds honestly it sounds like this thing is very misdesigned if you guys can't even figure out how to share it between kernel and user that's nuts that's like a massive spec fail I think it's not so much that we can't figure that one out. I think we can. It's just a question of deciding how how flexible we want to be with the bits that we don't know, the vendor-defined stuff. Well, I mean, including the vendor-defined stuff. It should be rigid. Yeah. There, there shouldn't be an ambiguity. It, it's a problem I, I, with I, the head. I think I think part of the problem is is that the uh, that the ambiguity the like the precision is specified in the protocols and not the DOE spec. So like. The CDAP protocol is is, is is well defined. The SPDM protocol is well defined. Um, so, so I, I think you had that on your slide, Jonathan, about like, do we just provide interfaces for known protocols and not and not a not a DOE driver? Basically, we, we, we define here's the CDAP interface, here's the here's the SPDM interface. I mean, short term, that was definitely my plan: is don't support anything else until we really need it, um, because I think that makes sense for the things we have today. And then we kind of evaluate the others as and when. Um, I would like to to move on, but Lorenzo, did you have a quick point on that? Yes, I wanted to ask a question, but I think you will uh, address it shortly. I mean, it's related to even mediating within a given protocol, in particular to CMA. But I think you'll you talk about this in a little while, so I'll wait. Yeah, um, not sure I address that particular question, but hopefully. Um, I mean, well, I mean, just briefly, SPDM sessions, they have uh, state machines and you need yes. to you need to record in a way that the state of those transactions within the protocol itself. So mediating there means keeping track of those state machines within a given uh, session. Uh, that's my question. It's not just mediating between different protocols, but also within a protocol in a way. So, but yes, yeah. Yes, you would need... You, you raise a good point there, we would need to prevent, even if we had a user, user space access, if it was being used for something like SPDM, it's it's hands off, don't touch that one. Because you're quite right, there's a, there's an immense quantity of state going on in SPDM. Well, well, there is user space, and as you mentioned, something else, I think that's where we should define the entity that mediates access to those mailboxes, in particular for CMA, but I think, let's move on. I mean, and we can discuss it later, probably yeah. offline. Uh, absolutely. Okay, so jumping on to SPDM um, and indeed CMA, but we'll do them this way around because it makes more sense for explaining what's going on. Um, this is the security protocol and data model from DMTF. Um, it defines a bunch of standard messages and the protocol and indeed all the state, as Lorenzo just mentioned. Uh, for device authentication and indeed mutual authentication. Um, that's an interesting side note that we probably won't go into, but what's mutual authentication useful for in the kernel world? Who knows? So if people have ideas on that, it would be good to hear. Um, it allows you to establish secure channels so you could have nice symmetric encryption. The, the first bit's done with public key, uh, private key type uh, asymmetric encryption to do authentication. Um, you can do integrity measurement. So has the firmware changed? Um, has the state of the device changed? 
Uh, what that means is sadly implementation defined. So there is an element there of who exactly is going to look after those measurements, but I suspect we won't get anywhere near that today. Um, you can also do things like key management for encryption. It's used over a ver uh, various different transports. So, I mean, one small detail is we'll probably do it as a library, and the initial um, proposal is definitely to do that, which is capable of being used on different transports. Um, an easy example for the sort of thing you can do with this is USB chargers uh, verify that a phone can cope with higher currents. So that does use mutual authentication. Basically, the charger and the phone have a little chat and establish who each other are, and only then do they crank up the power on the wire so that they don't set fire to your phone. Um, can also be used for preventing attacks like Thunderclap. Uh, this is a DMA sort of fake PCI device doing DMA attack. Um, there's actually a decent description of it in Alex uh, Merkes's talk, which I think was yesterday. Um, on the case of memory segregation, so I won't go into details on that, but you can prevent it as long as you know you're talking to the right device and SPDM and similar techniques and basically a device attestation um, can mostly prevent those attacks. Um, also, there is a whole bunch of stuff around managing what devices are connected to all your servers in a big cloud um, and being able to verify those in a secure way to make sure you've got what you expect. CMA, um, which is a PCI SIG uh, uh, ECN, is the Component Measurement and Authentication ECN. This uses a DOE mailbox, as described earlier, um, to carry SPDM messages. It does cover a bunch of other transports like MCTP, but at the moment we probably don't care in Linux. It defines a subset of SPDM, which is useful because it reduces the number of protocols that we need to support considerably. Um, what it says is things like the device must support at least this one or this one. So you either have R um, RSA or one of the elliptic key uh, combinations and particular hashes. So it reduces just how much we have to support in kernel to deal with whatever device is plugged in. Obviously, we might later want to put the more secure, fancy new crypto standards on top of it. Um, leaf certificates have to contain a bunch of information to relate to the device. It's a bit loosely defined, unfortunately, but typically things like serial numbers and vendor IDs so that you can be sure that there isn't an impersonation attack going on uh, where you're sort of forwarding these messages on to another device and getting that to reply. So why does Linux care about this stuff? Um, given that a lot of the models will assume, like the mobile phone charger one we had a minute ago, that this would be handled by some other entity in the system, be it either firmware or some trusted element or secure element, that sort of thing. A um, couple of obvious reasons. One, we might be the firmware. Um, so if you're doing something like Linux boot, it's more than possible that you don't have this in any other embedded firmware. You, this is quite complex stuff. You don't want to be running it in a very early stage of firmware boot. So you might well want to do it in the kernel for that. Runtime hardware state changes are an issue. So we've got hot plug, particularly if you're doing um, OS native hot plug uh, on PCI, then basically we're the only people who know about it. Uh, resets. So a classic thing for this is actually the next one, out of band firmware updates. So someone's used MCTP, switched your firmware, and then when you next reset, it loads a different firmware. So in those sort of cases, we need to be able to go and query and say, oh, hang on, is the state what we expect it to be? And they're also virtual machines. So one thing that's interesting in CMA is a VF can have its own CMA DOE instances. Unsurprisingly, they're not meant to be used by anything other than the virtual machine. There's no reason you'd do that. So this allows a VM to do verification of both that it's the device it expects to talk to, but also the state measurements that you can do can include details of how the PF is set up. So if there's things like the PF has debug interfaces, you could definitely have a measurement that reassured you that they weren't turned on, there wasn't a back channel. Um, even some of the things that are there for migration, if you really don't want the hypervisor knowing what you were up to and being able to read the state out, then you could lock it down um, and the device would then report that it was in a state where there was no way for the hypervisor to look at it. Um, the opening question here is, is this strong enough to justify kernel support? I think so. Um, I'm interested to hear counter views. Perhaps not today, because that could get a little deep and we're running low on time. 
So this one we wanted to talk on, uh, talk about a little bit on virtual machine use cases. So if people want to jump in on this, uh, the simple one's kind of obvious, which I mentioned a moment ago. You've got a per VF CMA instance, and we're providing a nice standard way to check that we trust the hardware and the state of the hardware. There is a power virtualized story here, which is that it can be useful to do particularly measurements of devices that are being used in a virtual machine um, that don't have a convenient DOE mailbox to do it. Um, so one option for this would be to um, basically insert a mailbox into what the VM is seeing um, and allow that to effectively pass through the measurements. Obviously, there's loads of ways we could do that sort of device attestation going into a VM, uh, but perhaps it's convenient to use the fact we already have a standard that is meant to perceive measurement of PCI device state. There has been a little bit of discussion about using this sort of technology for verifying fully emulated devices, so VertIO type devices. Um, cases where you've got things like uh, the VertIO backend is actually running in a different VM and you're routing it through the hypervisor and you just want to verify that you're, you're talking to the right person at the end of the line and not the wrong sort of device or someone trying to intercept it. And you can build a secure channel to have those communications without any attacks in the middle. Um, yeah, that's kind of all I had on this. Did anyone have any sort of suggestions or questions on this topic? Or thoughts on what they were thinking of doing with it? Sorry, Dan. So you may definitely protect against like, like, uh, like if you can verify the device, but like you could still be in the middle like you could have two NVMe devices, one trusted, one one not, and they could route the CMA through the good one, and then the next, your very next reader write to the NVMe register is uh, is the fake one, right? It's not. Um, you, 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 you'd have to wrap the entire driver in SPDM messages or something to make the whole thing secure all the time. Or use a measure because you can set up a secure channel that can't be intercepted because it relies okay. on private keys at either end. You could. So you could have your NVMe drive store some hash of what's been going on for the period of time, and then you could do a verification on that. Um, it's a bit messy. I, I'm not totally sure how this use model works. Um, okay. It's a kind of one that might make sense, and basically I'm fishing through whether anyone's interested in these use cases. I, I was going to say that uh, that that CXL .cache protocol has a. Trust me, I can participate in the in the uh, CPU cache protocol, can't I? And that seems like a, a perfect place to have a, have a CMA verification to say, do you really want a device that can launch its own vector attacks on everything? And you probably want to verify that first. Yes, no, absolutely. Uh, okay. We actually got further than I thought we would. Okay, so here we get into policy. Um, we obviously need a bunch of controls around this. As I mentioned here, there are, I've made no firm proposals yet, and I haven't seen any for what we actually do about this. So there are questions of granularity. Do we have system-wide policy that says, basically all device, all PCI devices on this system, obviously this is some years in the future when this is around a little bit more, uh, must successfully conduct a CMA authentication before we're going to allow them to be probed, uh, for drivers to be probed on them. Um, otherwise, we just don't trust them. Perhaps we tie it up to things like external devices. So we already have firmware descriptions that say this device is on an external port. And we say we're only going to trust external devices, or at least we're only going to make them bus masters um, and able to do DMA if we've had an exchange and they are who we think they are. Um, it's not totally clear what sort of granularity we want to do this at. Um, one option for this stuff is there are a number of security protections getting added in various places in the kernel uh, against things like Thunderclap, uh, where we might use bounce buffers or carefully segregated memory regions, uh, or indeed driver audits to make sure that we're immune to any attacks based on granularity of the IMMU. So this is where you've got your buffer that you actually wanted to do DMA into, but the IMMU is only protecting a larger area of kernel memory and potentially there's something of interest in the remaining space. So if we can verify the device, perhaps we can get away with slightly weaker audit requirements, um, depending on what people's security model is. Um, there are specific questions. Anyone 
do jump in during this. Um, so what do we do if there is no CMA uh, capable DOE instance available? Um, classes can often support them. So an example of this is CXL type three memory will definitely support the option. Um, thanks, Lorenzo. But doesn't require it. I guess we're gonna have to have some system policy around that. People, someone has decided whether type three memory devices must support the ability to attest that they are who they say they are and take measurements of firmware and things. Um, so chances are we'll just block probe if they don't um, have that support. Um, other questions like root certificates. This entire thing is based on certificate chains. Um, if we don't have the relevant root cert, so we haven't inserted the, the Huawei root certificate because we don't trust Huawei or we don't trust Intel. Um, just to use two safe options in this one. And then what do we do? Uh, do we just scream loudly and go, uh, root cert isn't here? Or do we point blank refuse to insert them? I mean, I guess if we were allowing the thing without CMA at all to be used, then we probably still have to allow it if we don't have the root certificate, but perhaps that needs a separate policy control. I think the only easy one is verification fails, which is we did have the right root certificate. We went through the whole process and we got to the end of it and the authentication didn't pass because basically our, our signed hash was wrong. Um, that would usually imply that someone was attacking the link or we had well, a bug most likely or some form of corruption going on. So that one's kind of easy. Any feedback on this stuff or? Oh, you had you had okay. investigated the uh, the IMA. IMA has a, a existing cert verification code in the kernel. I didn't see if can they support built in certificates? Can we like ship kernels with certificates, or do you need to always go back to user space to get certificates? Yes. So IMA allows for a bunch of different ways of inserting certificates. So you can do it inside a blob of memory passed from UFI. Uh, you can do it via an init RD sort of insertion, which is the only one I've implemented so far, just a proof of concept. Or you can do it uh, by building them into the kernel. But obviously, the issue with that is, I, I don't know, it would be an interesting question whether distributions would be willing to build it in. Um, there are certainly embedded cases where individual, you know, people are building their own kernels anyway and would indeed insert them. Moving on, certificate management. Now we can leverage a bunch of stuff that's there for particularly EVM in the kernel um, and the sort of certification of existing elements of the operating system that exists, uh, that's there for trusted boot. Um, that rather conveniently provides us a bunch of tools. So the way I've mapped it at the moment is to have a root key ring um, into which you can insert your, your CMA thing, uh, certificates for your root certificates. Um, and those are then checked against the chain that you read back from the device. There is a question here of granularity again. This is not doing anything to say, I've inserted this root certificate and I only trust it on this device over here. It's saying I trust it for all devices attached to the system. I don't know whether we need that sort of extra granularity. Sorenzo. Um, and there is another question as well, is that at the moment, I'm using a per SPDM instance keyring to deal with the actual certificates. This is kind of a convenience thing rather than anything more uh, because it allows us to use all of the keychain managements already in the kernel. I'm not sure whether this is a potential problem. It's a slightly odd model because it isn't a bunch of certificates at the same level. It, it's very much a chain where the thing might return three certificates and each signs the next one. But if anyone has any feedback on that, I'd be interested. Um, I'll just flick through what else is here, just as a preview in my last 10 seconds. So there was no way we were going to get to talk about this, but there is a whole bunch of stuff to be resolved around measurement as well. But that's a little way down the line because we need to get the authentication in place first. And I just include at the end references to the RFCs that are out there and specifications, etc. Thank you very much. Any last questions before? Lorenzo there are questions on, on the oh sorry chat. I'm terrible yep Jonathan to be honest I don't know if you have time to answer them but I mean uh, oh. I want I have a question we have a look I mean but I also have a question for you and Dan I mean where do we go from here I mean 
what's the follow-up? How can we work this out? Mailing list or? Uh... I think in the short term, sorry, Dan, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, the, 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 the one question I was wondering is like, do we make this part of like another PCI kind of pre-driver functionality or do we make this a, a first class citizen driver with its own with its own device model and you can add and, add and delete uh, DOE drivers? I think that was the kind of the open that Jonathan and I were tossing back and forth on the mailing list. That one and I think the ACPI question, which we can certainly start the conversation more openly on the mailing list with a few proposals, um, but it may well be something we need to take to a, a call that we organize for the purpose. I feel like all this authentication stuff of devices is going to end up everywhere, like PCI, USB, CXL, everything is going to have it in the end. It, it feels like it wants to be its own kind of piece of code, not, tight, not too tightly coupled to, to PCI. Yes, that's a, that's a good point. Um, yeah, so for the SPDM level, I absolutely agree. Um, I think, I mean, I know a number of other buses have said they're adopting that particular specification. Um, and it's based very tightly on USB in the first place. So basically, it is the USB spec with extra stuff. Can so, you yeah. tie it to the link encryption? Like, can you say I, I authenticated with SPDM and then I, I know that I did the IDE and my link is encrypted and authenticated? There's a bunch of extra stuff on, it's using SPDM, but there's a bunch of additional stuff you need for IDE to actually poke it into the relevant components. But you asked but, yeah. earlier, does the kernel need to know IDE? And if they're connected, then I think the answer is yes, because the kernel has to do the authentication with SPDM, and then it has to know that the IDE is authenticated. There's a, there's a subtlety there, which is that the kernel doesn't have to do the authentication with SPDM. We could well have firmware doing it. Um, well, then I, that wasn't the point. I want the kernel to do it because the kernel yeah. knows the policy. The kernel, kernel has the policy. Yes, um, that's certainly, yeah, certainly true. There is a there is a separation as well, which is technically SPDM when used for IDE is a different PCI DOE protocol to CMA. They it includes everything in CMA plus a bunch of other stuff. So there is a kind of expectation that if all you're interested for, or, or you've got a model where the expectation is someone else is dealing with the encryption, um, which if you're not doing peer to peer, because you've got a device where it doesn't make much sense, then you might well have a, a policy that just says firmware is going to bring it up and keep it running. And yeah, if it's in but that, NVMe that, drive connected to the host directly. Why do SPDM in the kernel at all then, if that's the kind of world you're going to live in? Because yeah. Like if I want to say I'm running a trusted kernel and the trusted kernel only talks to trusted devices, I can't trust that somebody else went and set up the encryption to my device. It doesn't make any sense. You'd have to trust your firmware and talk to it. Well, I so, don't. That's not that's not the kind of the trusted computing framework, right? Yeah, we don't trust yeah, the firmware. Yeah, I think there's, there's definitely a model where the OS is the center of trust, and but I think there's also a model where like the where the vendor wants to make sure that somebody's not plugging in something they're not supposed to. And, but I think that's not Linux's problem. I think the Linux problem is purely the kernel, kernel authenticated, kernel setup IDE. I will add, I was being a bit vague with firmware there. In some cases, this is things like the Realm Manager, perhaps in ARM's model, or the, I can't remember what it's called in AMD's, Seth, but there is a very low level piece of software you have to trust in order to get any of the encrypted VM stuff to work. I'm sorry, guys. I need to stop you. I mean, uh, I I think Jonathan makes sense to follow up shortly on in hack rooms and, and try to see how to make progress on this. I want to thank you very much for your presentation, anyway. And I think we can figure it out in uh, today. I mean, I'll to follow up on this. I we have a break now. I mean, we have. I think uh, overrunning. Let's start again at 35 minutes past the hour with the next presentation and thank you very much. Thanks, Renzo.
I notice few people raised hands. Please let me know if there is anything we can do. Lorenzo, I think people thought that that's how they indicate they are ready actually by mistake. <laughs> it's, it... Good. Yeah, I suppose so. Shortly, I will give you, I'll upload the presentation, Jacob, and hand over to you. Just a minute. I almost uh, thought the, the right lower right corner is the raise hand button. <laughs> Let me find one. We are ready to restart. You should be able to present, Jacob. So please man, go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm really uh, glad to be here. And uh, uh, the topic I wanted to bring today is about share, supporting uh, shared virtual addressing in the kernel. And then also that uh, implies that how do we want to handle uh, the MA request with passive inside the kernel. Uh, so this is not a uh, uh, kind of a new feature and it has been there and have VTT support uh, been there for a while, but there has uh, quite a bit of issues. And so this is an effort to um, kind of rewrite or um, refactor the, the code such that we address some of the uh, the concerns on the mailing list and uh, but the ultimate goal here is to uh, support the first of all the email request with passive uh, a lot of devices are coming with passive capability and also how we want us to uh, you know shared virtual uh, addressing basically share page tables between cpu and uh, the IOMMU. just a little bit uh, background and uh, just try to uh, uh, warm up the kind of discussion. I think uh, Will in the first uh, presentation is a very similar picture, but mine somehow got messed up um, when I converted to the PDF format. Sorry about that. I'll fix it later. I just realized that. Um, so basically we have uh, without uh, shared virtual addressing, without pass it on uh, the, the DMA versus DMA address versus CPU virtual address is, has go through a very uh, almost a symmetrical view. Uh, on the left hand side, CPU had MM view, and the CPU has its own TLB, and uh, the CPU page tables. On the right hand side, we have the IOM view, IO TLBs, and uh, the IO, <coughs> IO page tables in the memory. Uh, so everything's separate, and, uh, and uh, through DMA API, we have uh, IOVA allocated and also the device can, that can also use physical address uh, to address, uh, to do DMA as well. Uh, with this slide, I try to highlight the changes in red when we share uh, the page tables with CPU. So basically, um, IOM view and, and the MM view still have its own uh, TLBs, but CPU page tables are shared, therefore mappings are shared uh, and, they, and, and that, that enables the device to do uh, virtual address um, DMA. So that includes both, uh, you know, the user user mode, share virtual addressing, and the kernel mode. Uh, but this specific uh, discussion I want to have is uh, is uh, for the kernel only because we have some, uh, uh, I guess, special challenges in the kernel, and also use for user perspective. If you want to do share virtual address, there's no really other uh, address options. With the kernel, you can have other options that I wanted to discuss. So what's uh, what's in the current kernel is that uh, we're leveraging the, 
the SVA library um, that's mostly intended for user uh, SVM, and then to basically treat uh, the um, the kernel SVM as a special case, and therefore instead of binding uh, a pass a binding a device with a process MM, um, the, uh, we have a flag to indicate that we bind to a supervisor or a supervisor pass it or system pass it, uh, so that um, the um, uh, the pass it is pointing to the init MM uh, the kernel mapping. So of course we also have a lot of uh, special cases for handling kernel, such as we don't handle page fault and uh, no MMU notifier registered. And, and also there's the assumption that uh, we do, uh, the DM device driver who use that only use uh, direct map, but there's, uh, and also static. But the problem with that, of course, if we are exposing the entire kernel mapping uh, at API level, there's no restriction um, basically, the, the once you bind with the, the kernel mapping, uh, the DMA can go to say stack or vmalloc areas. There's no uh, and no even warning say for uh, unintended error. And, and then another issue is that uh, we don't have uh, a way to synchronize CPU and the IOTLBs. Um, so in case that is for for the for the kernel mapping that's dynamic like vmalloc or sometimes the direct map ADS updates, there's no uh, way to tell the IOMMU that uh, you need to flush the OTLB. And the third issue that, uh, that was brought up uh, in the mailing list discussion, especially by Jason, was that uh, and, uh, in the, in the kernel DMA is supposed to use DMA APIs. And um, but in this case, we're kind of uh, uh, diverged that they, API by using the SVA live. So, so in that uh, um, in that um, effort, in this effort is trying to address those uh, those concerns. And I just posted a, a patch set about a couple of days ago. It's kind of, it's kind of a, a last minute thing, but uh, the the patches try to. Uh, I try to propose, try to address the, the SVA and the DMA request with pass it in O3 addressing mode. The first of all is which, which we can support uh, physical address mode. So in this, this is the case similar to what we have in the DMA direct where um, some devices like a trusted device, you can, uh, even when IMMU is on, you can bypass IMMU, but this case is uh, on a per pass it basis. Uh, the second mode is the IOVA mode, which is making the DMA request with passive DMA API compatible. Uh, so we have a we have a supervisor passive will be mapped the same way as the device so the requester ID, which is the default uh, default domain. The third proposal, uh, third mode, is the KVA mode. It has more. It needs a little bit more attention, so I focus on this. A little more in the in a few in the next few slides. So in the KVA mode, uh, we try to support uh, a, a uh, basically uh, shared virtual address, uh, shared CPU table in the fast. Uh, we also call it fast mode. And, and another way is for another mode is sub mode is that uh, we have devices that's not trusted, will uh, but still want to use KVA address for DMA. We'll do a map on map similar to IOVA. The only difference is that it's the address is KVA. But we wanted to be able to switch between the two, uh, the fast mode and the strict mode uh, transparently. Um, in the patch, uh, I proposed uh, basically two APIs. And one API is uh, DMA passive enable. So in this, in this API is intended for um, so devices who want to use DMA uh, with passive, um, whether that's a physical mode or IOVA mode or kernel virtual address mode. And to call this and to set up the, uh, that, uh, the actual uh, uh, the addressing mode. And uh, this is on a per device basis. 
Uh, and so each device uh, could have its own mode. And for, the, for each device, um, it's uh, mutually, the modes are mutually exclusive. Um, the diamond new domain, which we'll touch on later, is that uh, that's used for the KVA mode where uh, as mapping is still needed on an RMM domain you know, basis. Um, for KVA mode, we also, I also kind of added a, a, a new uh, API that's doing the KVA mapping that used the domain returned by the previous uh, enable API. So basically it's like, um, it does some sanity checking for the uh, CPU address range. And also um, uh, there, there are more potential to change, uh, to, uh, to check as well, to add more sanity check as well. But so far it's just a, a sanity checking for the address range. So here I put a link uh, to the patch set. Hey Jacob, I have a question on this. Yeah, please. Um, so how does it look from an endpoint device driver side? Um, does the endpoint device driver know that the, that the device is in PSID IOVA mode or in PSID KVA mode? Or what does the implementation look like on the, on the device driver side? Device driver who wants to use, I would use pass it, and they would have to make up their, their decision. Um, well, they can get it from their own capability, but I would assume the device driver already know what they want. Maybe I missed the, your your point. Um, so um, my impression is that with KVA, the device driver can just bypass the DMA API and use uh, the virtual addresses as DMA handles, right? Yes, that's uh, if they're yeah, that's if that's their uh, you know preference. Is but that, of course, they need to pass the enable API to be successful. That's being scrutinized by the. But that's not portable, right? We can't just bypass all of our portability extractions for, for DMA. How, how is the driver going to work on other architectures? That's not how we design things in the kernel. Like, I really don't see where this KVA stuff fits in or why we need it. Well, in, why we need it, it's uh, basically going, sharing why we need to provide a way to, uh, to share page tables, right? So that provides some uh, security uh, benefit over, say, physical address. What do you mean? The kernel mapping and the physical mapping are the same, the, right? Well, the kernel page table still provides like permissions, uh, things like that. Well, it's, it's not as, uh, I guess, I have a, maybe you can, Go to the well, next but slide. again, that's kind of that you're just, you're talking about a, a refinement of bypass in that case. You're talking about mm -hmm. a bypass mode or a pass through mode where instead of just having all physical memory be readable writable, you have fine grained page permissions under there, and that that's fine, that's great. But why mm -hmm. would a driver care about any of this? Um, it's most it's for performance reasons too, right? Because once we turn on IMMU, um, just the map, the cost of creating the mapping. Um, no, no, no. We're running the IMMU in bypass mode. Oh, bypass mode has is a pass through mode completely. You're right. Right. Yeah. But you can't you can't make them. You can't say I'm going to not support bypass mode, but allow KVA because you you've broken all of the security guarantees that turning off bypass provided. It doesn't make any sense. Bypass. bypass doesn't provide any security, right, Jason? Um, I'm missing well, that's my bypass. point. It, it doesn't, so right. and neither does KVA. Well, with KVA, we have, I think Jacob talked about having two different modes. Right? One is a strict mode, another one is an SVA mode. So when you put it in the strict mode, it works as if you're DMA mapping and unmapping strictly like how the first, the second option works. But that's not KVA. That's just a normal DMA API. Correct. Um, yeah, it's it, it's it's you know in my mind I was thinking more about uh, compatibility, so you can actually check whether the driver is abusing um, without doing the map or unmap in the first place. And once you have validated it, it's sort of a, a reference check. Once you have validated the driver, it seems to be doing all the right things. You can put it in the performance mode in production, actually. But right? the performance mode is not secure. It allows unlimited access to the kernel virtual address space. That's not secure by definition. Uh, it's only for trusted devices. Well, right. 
we are not the policy of trusted devices belongs in the hands of the administrator. It's not a device driver centric thing. The device mm -hmm. driver should use the DMA API and the administrator should decide if the DMA API provides a high performance bypass or not. Yeah, we could have user input, but also we uh, like we have the for the CPI, we have the secure uh, SATC object that helps enumerate which device is trusted. The, the, the admin or the policy engine can, can use that to decide if the, it runs in performance bypass mode or not. It's not something that should be part of the device driver, and the device driver should not be calling things like KVA APIs that assume an identity map of the kernel API because it just doesn't work. The device driver is running work. in DMA mode. It needs to yeah, be running yeah. on top of the DMA API. But this provides a way to to fail, say, the, the device driver say, yeah, enable the KVA mode and it's not trusted, I get failed or not, you know, allowed by the... I mean, but there's no performance gain to doing this versus the DMA API running in bypass mode or the DMA run, API running in KVA mode under the covers. Right. Bypass mode would be, of course, going to physical address would be the fastest. Right? Jakob, but, uh, Jakob you, you're really doing a, a, a complete layering violation here again. You try to put policy into the device driver, which is the wrong thing to do. The device driver uses a common API and somebody sets the policy and then it, this, this infrastructure can allow bypass or KVA or whatever, somebody who configured that, that infrastructure and the policy in there uh, to do the right thing. But no, mm -hmm. it's wrong to do it in the device driver itself. It's just layering, layering backwards. So can we... device drivers have no access to policy, period. Right, I think we can probably look at the uh, the DMA pass at KVA as a hint from the device driver. The, the, DM, the driver says, I would prefer to do this thing, but the kernel policy can dictate whether this is even allowed. Why? Device. There's, there's, no why? there's no point in having a KVA mode in the device driver. Just use the DMA API. There's not a performance hit to using the DMA API properly. Well, it, it's still, when, if you use DMA API, they will have a separate uh, you know, page tables, right? You use in no, that's and... policy under the DMA API implementation. You can do whatever you mm -hmm. want. You can put KVA under there and return just an identity pointer. It doesn't matter. That's what I see. Thomas means when he says that's the policy layer. Okay, right. so you're and, and you're and saying and we you could... call you mm -hmm. call into the DMA API and you get a pointer, and what mm -hmm. the the property of that pointer is decides the the policy in the DMA API and not, so it, it, the, the hint, even the hint is completely bogus because it's the policy says no, or if the administrator says, I want everything run with KVA because it's so great for whatever reason, it's a policy decision by the administrator. And it has nothing mm -hmm. to, to do in the device driver. The device driver doesn't care about it. It gets okay, a pointer. Right. I think all you're saying is that now that makes sense. So what you're saying is that instead of creating this KVA option, just use the IOVA and based on the policy, it could either match the IOVA is just mapped to the KVA itself um, or if it's, a, if it's a full mapping. So that way the API doesn't necessarily change, but the implementation can change underneath for that particular device if the administrator chose to do that. Yes, right. Uh, it, 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 the, the administrator can put a policy in place that for device who uh, the, uh, the, the mapping is going to be KVA based and it returns a pointer. And if, if it, he decides it's bypass based, it still returns a pointer. Right, that's how it works today. If, if okay. the device struct has a, has a little flag that says the, the, the DMA API is running in direct mode and it just, just returns the physical address of the given struct page. It's very fast, like there's no overhead here. If you want to stick a bypass or you want to stick a KVA or you want to stick a full IOMMU mm -hmm. with invalidate underneath yeah. that, that the DMA API is the place to do it. Yeah, the only, uh, yeah, I thought about this. That the only thing is uh, maybe when the DMA API today does not support passive. So we need a way to 
I guess. That's what I was again. saying in the email thread is you should create a struct device that has the correct information for the DMA API to support pass it. Okay. And then it can be a proxy for the physical device. It has the proxy. I mean, that's the easiest way to squeeze it into the API we have today. It's all device, struct device centric. There are probably other options, but that's like a really hacky, easy way. So we, uh, so let me try to uh, paraphrase. So, so we want to basically uh, uh, have a you know policy that predefines the device, uh, whether you know it's KVA or or you know bypass whatever that is, is transparent to the device driver. So the device driver just call the API, get a pointer, and then whatever that is, it could be KVA or it could be BioVA, but policy already predefined right? right and by the same time but the but the fact that it needs they pass it to do work submission is already implied you know it's and uh, you're not going to need to pass it right? can <laughs> is this um uh, well, that's what I was saying. With you create the dummy, the, the, the DMA API base is based on struct device. You pass it in a struct device that has a DMA context associated with it. And today, that's only a RID. So if mm -hmm. you create a new, if you create a new struct device that's got the RID plus the pass it, and you encode that in the IOMU data, you pass it into the DMA API. Well, you can make it work. Um, like it's it's still very simple. If you're doing the direct map thing, the DMA API does exactly what it does right now. It says you're direct mapping, just return the physical address of the page, done. Like there's there's nothing to do there. Yeah, um, yeah. If you're doing map unmap, then it goes down into the IOMU driver and the IOMU driver pulls out the IOMU data from the struct device and sees that it's got a pass it associated with it and it mm -hmm. manipulates the correct IO, IO page table. Yeah, that's actually maybe the next slide I have. I have done. Jason, what you, what, you, what you just proposed sounds like, sounds a lot like the MDEV implementation we already have and which we want to make up for it. No, this has nothing to do with MDEV. This is in kernel DMA. Right. Like when, yeah. I say, when yeah. I say create a struct device, I mean create a struct device as a handle to use in the DMA mm -hmm. API, not something that has a SysFS presence. Yeah, but yeah, yes. okay, but, M, but MDEV was created as a, as a wrapper around PES on PSIDs, right? No, M MDEV is a, a lifetime model in SysFS for creating VFIO devices. That's that's all it is. And if when Christoph's next series goes in, that will literally be all that it does. All the messing around with the IOMMU is deleted. Okay, so, sorry, Jason, I, I think uh, in the IOVA mode, I mean, I, uh, the, AP, the patch that I submitted address what you uh, what you suggested here. So basically, we map the, the read plus pass it the same way as the read, right? So, so we get IOVA, and and the word, and then so you can do DMA requests. But, but this is not the IOVA. DMA API. That's that's the whole objection. This is some other API. We don't need a whole other API for this. Use the DMA API. Yeah, we could have pre uh, the the DMA API will be the same. I mean, once you have basically both, you know, the supervisor pass it and the default pass it point to the same default domain, the DMA API just work the same. There's no change in that case, right? So that, that, that's for IOVA, of course. I thought that was the, the original suggestion. But for KVA, uh, is that correct? I mean, I, 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 I don't know quite what you're talking about. Like, no, I, I'm I'm talking about saying you you said the read to pass in and the read right we map the same way, so based both use the default DMA domain, and in that case the DMA API would just work because DMA API works on the default domain, right? You said default domain. It wouldn't be the default. Well, it would be the domain associated with the struct device. And if you create a struct yeah. device for a pass it, then the domain is a pass it domain that matches the read plus the pass it. So. Okay, so isn't that the same as the the aux domain then? I mean, if we have a passive associated with its own domain, is that what you? But I thought you, you, let's not get too much into the weeds there. You, you end up with a domain that's associated with a passive that matches read plus passive, 
and you can add page tables or add PTEs to it, right? Like how we name it mm -hmm. and how it gets exposed through the IOM EPA is a different conversation. But that's deep, deep down in the details, right? It's not, yeah. the driver Jacob, shouldn't see any of that. I should ask you to wrap up, please. So, yeah. thank you. I mean, one minute or so left. So please, if there is anything, just go yeah. ahead and ask. Otherwise, we'll go back to our rooms. Okay. So I think we need a, probably an, 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 an offline conversation. Jason, uh, maybe in the hack room, or I can ping you offline. Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> the, we're running out of time here. Um, just uh, one, maybe one minute, and to try to try to um, try to highlight kind of the problem we're facing. So, so disregard the policy issue. So. We still have that uh, uh, IOTLB uh, synchronization issue. Is uh, if we want to use uh, CPU page table sharing, right? So, so we have here I listed a few cases that modifies the, the direct map, and then, and uh, would would that be a, you know a reasonable thing to do to add a kernel MMU notifier for those cases for limited uh, you know uh, use cases. And modify the, the kernel page to, you know, those cases that affect uh, I'm on UTLB. I think you really need to describe what the use case of this is and what the performance properties are. Um, like adding the invalidations that you'd need to make KVA work are not free. So there better be a good payback for this. And frankly, yes, I don't see have. what it is. Yeah. We'll address the performance issue, and uh, we're currently evaluating it, and uh, and uh, will be uh, published once once you know we have a solid data. But we see positive results. Yeah, you're right. We definitely want performance benefit. Otherwise, there's no point in doing that compared to IOVA. How often do you have consecutive kernel virtual addresses that are not physically consecutive too? The only case that I know of that happens is under the VMAP. Well, but that's still a security advantage. I mean, we, if we want to do uh, DMA with virtual address compared to physical address, right? I mean, it's it's both performance and security. It's. I, I, you can get the security without having to pay the performance cost. I could set up an IO page table with sort of a, a physical address mapping that's sort of granular and, and more secure than what we have today. I don't need to use KVA to do that. The main thing that KVA gets me is that I get to have the VMAP still be linear in my IO MMU. Mm -hmm. So I'm struggling to understand where that's a performance win. Yeah. I I think we need to uh, wrap up and then uh, maybe Jason, I can talk to you offline. Yeah. I think it's uh, it's an interesting discussion. I fear that it may take longer than a couple of minutes. So I think it makes sense to continue in dark rooms. I mean, so I have to stop you guys. Sorry about that. Um, thank you. Um, no, thank you for presenting and everyone who chimed in. We'll take a short break, I mean, five minutes break. Let's rest, I'll try to restart five minutes past the hour. So actually it's two minute break, but I mean, uh, let's restart as soon as we can, but let's take a little break anyway. Uh, we restart in five minutes or so. Thank you.
Hi, Ashok. In the interest of time, I think uh, you should be able to take presenter uh, role and go ahead. Uh, I yeah. will have to stop you. I will have to stop you at 35 past the hour. So I think we better get going. And thank you very much. You can go Sounds ahead anytime. Sounds good. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, Emega, are you around? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Okay, so I'll give you a brief intro on um, you know today's topic, and then I'll let Mega take over. Um, so basically, when we started working with the uh, IMS framework and things like that, we figured out that you know we wanted to make some enhancements to how um, interrupts are being allocated in the device drivers. Um, one of the deficiency was uh, all drivers actually have to allocate everything that they need upfront during probe time, and uh, nothing could be dynamically added or deleted. Um, of course, this was a this was a limitation with how the legacy MSI worked, but uh, not necessarily a limitation with respect to how uh, MSIX was defined, or for that matter, how IMS will also you know be defined actually in future. So, um, given that, um, we also saw that how um, VFIO was sort of trying to be uh, playing nice um, in in ensuring that the um, a guest will not use a ton of um, system vectors by uh, by allocating them on demand underneath the covers whenever um, the guest does an unmasking of an IRQ. Um, so even, and, and there, there were obviously, you know, it, it's drawn into a big hole there because there is no success or fail um, for the unmask operation itself. It only um, is present for the allocation of the IRQ. So um, we we're kind of trying to, you know, back, back out some of those things and, um, make some changes. So we first obviously started with how um, we are changing MSIX, for instance, um, how to dynamically add and remove vectors. And we have a few opens on IMS uh, we can address right after this. Go ahead, Megan. Yeah. Uh, Ashok, does that, uh, and Mega, does that, does that patch set actually address the, the current problems of, of of the word stuff, which violates all uh, rules of, of of our interrupt subsystem in at once, or is it still based on the same mess? Um, the, for this uh, the the proposal that uh, Mega is working on is being able to add um, vectors after probe time. It does not address the VFIO, you know deficiencies on pitholes that it, it made wrong assumptions about how these things work that will be addressed separately so this is just for the core part providing an api to dynamically add and remove vectors does it answer your question thomas yeah yeah kind of Um, okay, so as uh, Ashok pointed out, um, we wanted to make the uh, MSI allocation in the kernel much more uh, flexible and dynamic. Uh, currently, each device driver can um, just ask for how many ever MSIX interrupts that they want upfront uh, during their probe phase. Uh, but with the introduction of this new API, we are able to allocate uh, MSIX interrupts even after probe phase. Uh, we've introduced this new API called uh, PCI add MSIX IRQ vector. Um, so basically, this API needs to be called only after a um, certain number of MSIX interrupts have already been allocated um, using uh, other helper APIs like the PCI alloc IRQ vectors or PCI enable NM MSIX range, etc. Um, so each time this API is called, it only adds one MSIX vector um, to the device. And if it's successful, it will return uh, a zero-based device relative interrupt index, which in other words is just the um, entry number into the MSIX table. Um, so this, uh, whatever is returned, could be easily used with the uh, existing PCI uh, PCI API to get the corresponding MSIX uh, interrupt. So this doesn't change anything with the uh, legacy drivers. Uh, legacy drivers can still simply use uh, the existing 
PCI alloc IRQ vectors API. Um, so did we have any comments on this so far? Uh, okay, so um, I've, I've um, we have the patches ready and uh, it's ready for submission. And after this talk, uh, most likely I'll be submitting it to upstream. So earlier, um, I mean, we had this similar patch set around a couple of years back, wherein uh, we had uh, no definite use case at the time, but now with the VFIO uh, use case, we hope that this will find uh, much more uh, speed in the kernel community. Um, so yeah, uh, that's all I had. Ashok, you can carry on. Okay, so um, with that being said, the um, the two other opens I had for IMS were um, sort of familiar. The first one is more familiar, I think, to everybody. Um, IMS was sort of uh, defined in a way that uh, allows a bit more flexibility for devices to uh, to define or dictate the format of where these messages sit on the device or in or in memory itself if we need to choose so um, right now i think the ims core has prescribed a format uh, which is exactly what uh, the current um, the first implementation of it from dsa actually provides they're you know not exactly the same as pci and the msix uh, formats but they're slightly more optimized for storage on the device itself right um, so that I believe, um, you know, maybe um, Jason, you you, men, you had mentioned that you have certain other devices where uh, the format isn't exactly the same and, you know, um, how we should um, define them uh, for future uses. I, I don't think the format should be part of the, the core infrastructure. The format belongs in the device driver. Each device is going to have its own format. Like, I don't expect the next Intel device will reuse the same format that IDXD is using. Right, right. Um, so I think that's something to, you know, I think maybe the first implementation would kind of keep what uh, the DSA format is and um, it, it's definitely more valuable for the device driver to actually specify where these formats sit. That's all. Actually, uh, um, right, and it might I be think it just boils down to where do you put the RQ chip implementation or what do you call the RQ chip implementation? If the IRQ chip implementation is called IRQ chip IDXD, then everything makes perfect sense. If you call it IRQ chip IMS, and it's kind of weird. Correct. Exactly. I think that that makes sense. With IMS being standardized, we almost make it look like how the PCI MSIX format is, but you know something different. Um, it's certainly difficult to teach the core every single time. So you know, as we progress along, I believe um, we will probably make the um, IMS more of a device-centric format rather than um, IRQ chip coming from the driver rather than uh, the core itself, actually. Um, that's certainly a, a good direction. Um, and I think the next part we had was um, IMS also, uh, at least for the IDXD driver, has um, a field that we program in the MSIX permission table um, because we allow um, SVM type operations that use the, the NQ command uh, to submit from uh, the uh, to, from the guest driver itself, and when such submissions happen, the driver need, the device needs to verify whether the uh, interrupt that's specified in the descriptor is authorized for by this VM or not. So in order to make those um, checks, the device driver device needs to be programmed with a with a passive entry that belongs to the guest itself. Now I think the first implementation we spoke about was. If there is every device has a default passive, and if it is stored in stuck device, then IMS core can actually program this also because it knows the format on the device and it also can program the passive when. But again, you, you've mixed up things. This is all IDXD special behavior, all of this. this another device might but, use the passives for different purposes and might not need this security check on the passive or might not put it in the IMS entry. Right, right. No, I, I understand that. I think this is only if the device driver wants, this is not enforced by the code. This is required by the device driver. So that's how the, the API works, right? So if you have no, no definition of user space or a kernel submission that specifies an interrupt handle along with the descriptor, you certainly don't need the passive thing at all, right? I thought the issue was you needed to make the passive dynamic because the guest is changing it or something. That is the second part of it. So if 
we provide a, something like a mediated device, right? Um, and, and that is fixed. We already have a facet for it. The core can actually program the pass permission table along with it to make sure that inner VM interrupts don't cross each other's boundary, right? That's, that, that's the purpose. The issue for number two really comes along when the device, uh, when the driver inside the guest is doing say kernel SVM for instance, and there is a new passive that's allocated, which will be in the guest passive range, that programming happens much later. And that the, the, the host driver, the mediator driver will be the one that actually intercepts that permission programming from the guest itself before it programs um, the physical device with the, what the host passive translation should be, right? which cannot be done by the core, it needs to be done by the driver itself. So if we, um, if the IMS formats and the programming are completely within the driver, you have that flexibility of, um, of switching the passive for the guest when the guest is programming the real passive, which will be different from the default passive for the device. Right, for example, a mediated device can have a passive one as the default passive with it that was created you know, at the time of creation of the device. When the guest is actually trying to do SVM operations, it needs a passive on its own, and that's a guest passive one, but guest passive one is not the physical passive, so you need to you know, intercept in the host driver, convert that guest passive to a equivalent host passive, and it must be programmed in the descriptor for that. Yeah, but that that only works for 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 this particular setup where we actually can trap the access into the in into the IMS. Right. But but as we discussed before, this is not a general resolution, and it's it's going to fall flat with anything else. So so rather than having yet again a magic interface which just works for 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 IDE, uh, IDXD, uh, while we are knowing that IMS needs this for in in other scenarios where the where the storage of the of the of the passive is in a totally different uh, place, which is not trappable, why why aren't we going going uh, right away and do a proper uh, uh, set up of this that the, the, the guest actually uh, requests the, the or the negotiates the passage set up uh, with the with the hypervisor I mean we're going can we please 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 not do all these device specific hacks if we have to solve to solve a, a, a general uh, a problem the next driver will have to solve it anyway. But um, then we have drivers which do A and we have drivers which do B and we have no consistent interface. Doesn't right. make sense. I think your, your suggestion is rather than making it a device specific uh, thing, we probably should use some form of a hypercall or something to negotiate the guest passage directly from the host. And now you know exactly what that passage should be. Yeah, I mean, you say, you need a hypercall or whatever it, whatever you call it, and say here I I want to use guest passing five for device uh, X Y Z, and then the host says okay I I grant you I don't grant you or whatever, uh, which which all which also gives you uh, a proper error handling, and then if it grants it then the host takes care that the right that the that the host passive, which is which is or the translated passive, is written to the right place where the host can access it, and that's universal functional for not right. only for for IDXD, it's also functional for for all the scenarios Jason Jason uh, described in 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 the email conversation. I see. So, but the only. Um catch is that um, this is this happens much later when um, when the guest is actually um, 
programming the IRQ, right? It's not done. It's done much later in the guest driver life cycle. Right? The binding binding that pass it with the IRQ happens dynamically in the guest. So the hypercall can actually get the translation between the guest and the host pass it, but we also need a hypercall to program the IRQ itself with this guest pass it in order for the code to properly program it directly, correct? Probably yes, but uh, it depends. I mean, if the if the IRQ set if the IRQ setup is is done uh, is anyway trapping out into the host. Uh, and the IRQ is related to to a particular device. Then the host knows the the the, the requested pacet already. So I'm not sure whether you you need an extra hypercaller uh, for that. Yeah. So I mean, the, the, that's the difference, right, Thomas? It's not the default passive. This passive is something different than the device's default passive. So every struct yeah. device has a passive. That's that's good, which we can always figure out, but the guest is now allocating a new passive to use SVM type operations on it. Yes. So, he so, so it has, it, 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 the guest, the guest, the guest allocates guest passage five. And then because it knows it's a guest, it calls the hypercall and says, Hey, I want guest passage, use guest passage five for uh, device X, Y, Z. Right. So, so the, the, the host or the, the hypervisor says, okay, I know, oh, this is a device which belongs to the guest and I'm going to provide a translation and the host has a, has a, a, a device representation of the guest device, right? So it can stick that allocated, it can allocate a passive right there, can stick it into that struct device. And when right. the, the interrupt programming happens on the, on the guest, the, the host knows this is an interrupt associated to 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 this uh, particular device. So, so I'm not seeing the problem here. Right. Okay. So uh, we need to trap when the MSIX entry in the guest is being programmed, and then switch it over to. Um, at that point, actually, then that's the when the real physical permission table gets programmed. Okay. Yeah, because at that point, because you you did the setup in the right way, so a host requests the the passive translation, which the which the uh, a guest requests the translation, which the host grants, and the host associates it to that particular device. Now the now the 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 uh, the guest starts the interrupt, which programs the MSI entry, which traps out into the host, but the host already knows the translation. Okay, so, yeah, so and, then, and we will, that, that makes so perfect then it's, sense. So for MSIX, that's completely transparent. It might not be uh, completely transparent for the the use case chasing is envisioning, but... Uh, well, I'm I'm worried that we're building hypercalls that are really narrow in scope. Right. In which way, Jason? Well, and they're only usable for IDXD, is what I mean. No, I mean I mean passive translation is not is should be not restricted to IDXD, right? No, I think what what Intel has done with the way they work their IMS and the fact that they have an IMS table, not like dynamic allocation of the vectors is very much restricted to IDXD. And does the hypercall you're thinking of only work in that world? I'm I'm still kind of struggling. Like, no, 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 I mean I mean for your use case, you need you need a you need a passive translation as well, right? I'm not sure we do. Like the device is much more intelligent. It it knows that the that there's a VM and it knows that the VM has is restricted to some passives. When the VM goes and asks for an interrupt, the device can make the right decision. I suspect. Uh, uh, yeah. Also, for yeah, passive translation, we have a separate interface, where the virtual MMU. 
through the day by memory framework, we can build the answer information just for pancit, we don't need hyperchrome. But uh, Thomas, you earlier you discussed that maybe for guest request RQ, generally we may want a hypercore to make sure that the host side resource can be secured. For that part, maybe we, maybe we need a hypercore. Correct. Right. But for passes itself, yeah, I think uh, we, will, we already have a mechanism to build all the necessary information based on the new, you know, day by memory I, framework. I mean, if you, if you, if you can do it by, uh, via IOMMU and do the, the passive translation via IOMMU, uh, or the virtual to IOMMU, then this is going to, to end up somewhere in the host as well, right? Yeah. And, and is associated to that particular device. So the host has the information. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, then you don't need a hypercall because you already have the translation that the host already associates to, this, through, uh, to that path through device. So in the case, the interrupt is programmed it has all information and, and it, the guest traps out into into the into the host uh, the host has all the information so yeah i i, su I suppose when guest uh, trying to write the guest to msi x entry at that point the information should be already the host side so when yes. that, that operation is trapped then the host ID, IDXK driver should be able to figure out the host path. Yeah. And then we just need a method to net the RQ chip to program that okay. ID to the I mean, I mean, entry, the, right? So what happens yeah. So what happens if 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 the if the guest if the guest did not uh, do that uh, IO memo uh, thing translation set up upfront before trying to program? Yeah, it, it, it must be done before programming MSI X entry. Right. Yeah, sure. It must be done before, but what happens if it didn't? If it didn't, uh, when, when, when it writes that entry, the host will say there's no host, uh, physical passive. I, I think that's why I said the hypercore idea still makes sense. You mentioned that when guests are trying to request RQ, there are multiple reasons. Maybe the host cannot satisfy the requirement. Passive is one thing. Another thing is maybe there, there's no enough IRT entry, right? So generally, we may sti still need a hypercore to uh, detect such failure in case of a host uh, shortage, resource shortage. But right. just for the, yeah. For that part, I uh, agree with you. You mentioned that earlier. I mean, yes. I mean, the, 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 the question is, and, and we discussed that before, and we never came to a conclusion, uh, is, do we want to be robust and polite and uh, let the guest know that uh, a resource is not available or are we going to end up with just non-functional things or is that is, guest in the end, going... I think we will need such a mechanism at least uh, for cooperate, cooperative guest it can use this hypercode to know that you know host not meet its requirement right, right. So, so, but the the, the hypercall is an orthogonal issue. Then, if we if we if we require the 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 IO MMU translation anyway, uh, then uh, yeah, but the hypercall is not for for passive, right? The hypercall is still maybe some just for request RQ. For guest request RQ, is need to do a hypercall yes. to make sure yes, that the host have every resource ready, right? Right. Didn't, didn't I mean, we talk about this when we were discussing all this, that, that Microsoft Azure or Hyper-V had, um, had these hypercalls already and that, that just they were just kind of missing from the standard Intel stuff? Uh, this hypercall is the Intel, right? We're just talking about some general mechanism in case the host cannot, uh, you know, get a uh, necessary resource, then guess the no. It no, I mean, I, I mean, I, what I understood is that Hyper-V had a hypercall to set up an MSIX, and and that's how they did theirs. But on on the oh, yeah, right. kind of the normal Maybe KVM side, similar. we do a PCI write to an MSIX vector address and trap it. Right. right? That one allows you to return an error, and the other can... doesn't. Yeah, we we is it okay to use the same one? Or maybe have... we need to sound Lina. Yeah. Yeah, and the and the the the, the PCI write to the MSIX entry is is 
I mean, it's trapped, and then what's the what's the outcome if the host cannot provide the resources? So the, the guest will not see an interrupt that will not see why. So that's what we have right now, which is suboptimal. So Jason, you're saying uh, Hyper V already has a has a has a hyper call for 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 setting that up. I thought that came up in this long, long thread. Sorry, it's been a while, so I don't remember exactly. Yeah, but I, 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 I've had that impression. I, yeah. Yeah, they, they I have forgot a most to of get, it. Get to the, yeah. I, I thought that was for setting the inner pre-map entry. Right. I thought that was for the inter pre-map entry setup, right, Jason? Not necessarily for the PCI MSIX stuff. I well, that's, we do the, in, the normal case, the KVM case does the inner pre-map entry setup right. when it traps the MSIX, right? And, and right. you know, what I had inferred is that instead of doing the MSIX right and then trapping it, they did a hypercall and set up the remapping entry and you know whatever else was needed. Hmm. Yeah. Which which makes sense because it's polite. If if the host runs all the source the resources, it can at least tell the, the guest, uh, oh no, this is not working. Right. Well, what I liked particularly about that approach is that it gave an option where you could do a hypercall and say the hypervisor. Know, set up a remapping entry and give me the adder data pair for that remapping entry and I will program it where it needs to go. So if I'm using MSI, I program it in MSI. If I'm using some IMS thing, I program it, program it in the IMS thing. It no longer means, it, it, the hypervisor no longer has to trap all this stuff. Right, right. right. Yeah, uh, and, and in the particular case where you store it in, 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 in memory, uh, like what, what you, your device is going to look like, the hypervisor can't even trap it. Well, exactly. That's that's why I like it so much. Is that it's clean. Yeah, and and it makes sense even from the from the uh, uh, from the robustness uh, side in the guest because the guest then actually knows that a particular interrupt is not going to be to come in be, because the request IQ or whatever the mechanism is where we hide this will just fail. Correct. Yes. And that makes a lot of sense. Yep. And 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 basically, you can make that hypercall mandatory for 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 the IDXD case stuff, and and then we can add on on it for for JSON requirements to hand back the information he needs to have in 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 the memory. I think if you make if you make a hypercall that hands back the information you need, then then IDXD can be solved by not using MSIX. Like, don't emulate MSIX in the guest. Give it a proper device specific IMS interface. And you know, if you have to trap it or not, whatever. But you're communicating in a clean way. You can communicate the right. passive. You can do SVA. You can do all this crazy stuff because you're not restricted by what MSIX gives you. Right. Correct. Ashok, uh, sorry, I need to ask you to wrap it up. So please, uh, if you need, I think please go is, ahead. Right, I think th this is a good discussion. So we will, you know, probably go back to the drawing board and get the uh, the hypercall related things worked out and follow up in the mailing list. Okay, that's good. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Can, thanks. Jason. Can we can we start a, a new thread for that? The old one is yes, is, is already <laughs> old, old already is under, unreadable. It's a stack overflowed already, so let's do a new yes. thread. Thanks, Thomas. Exactly. Yeah. Thank Thanks, Lorenzo. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. I mean, we'll take a 10-minute break and start again at 45. Thank you very much.
Hey Kevin, we are about to restart. Um, I'm going to make you a presenter. Uh, second or no? Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, let me start. You should be in presenter mode now and you're all uh, ready to go. Yeah, I can control. Thank you. So, so today, uh, Bao Lu and I will introduce the Unified I/O page table management for pass for pass through devices. Uh, first, I will give a brief background for the and also some high level concepts. After that, because this is a field involving many tasks, so I also want to spend some time to review from the plan, including a list of uh, planned tasks. Um, after that, Paolo will introduce how to manage the security contents for password devices. This is one important aspect for user initiate DMA. Uh, after that, based on revealing times, there are several other opens we can further discuss. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, just feel free to stop me. So basically, I think the current problem is, uh, maybe most of you know that now, previously, two years ago, there, there's a, there is only one password framework, framework in Nina's kernel, that's VFL. And one year ago, we also have the VDP, the second one. So now we have two password frameworks, both provide the similar functionality to the user space. And today they have uh, their own IMMU logic to manage our page table. Uh, then that logic is relatively simple, but uh, moving forward, when we talk about some new IMMU features, such as the uh, passive the support, nested translation, IO page fault, etc., if we uh, duplicate those logic in every framework, it doesn't scale. So here, I think the proposal is to have a unified framework, the IMMU, to centralize to centrally manage every you know, IOPG table for password devices. And any new feature developed, introduced to this new framework can be shared by both um, and VDP. So the, the user space applications <coughs> will have a unified interface uh, via uh, slash dev slash MMU for any related activities. And then the VFL and the VDP become device driver. They only handle the you know user access to the device resource. And of course, we also need to support the for you know for backward compatibility. So we still need to support the legacy UAPI in VDP and the VFL. But within uh, VFL and the VDP, uh, their existing MMU driver will be converted to a shim layer to collect the legacy UAPI to the internal um, dev MMU helper functions. So in the end, this is, uh, you know, in a few, uh, once this framework is ready, in the future, everything related to your DMA will be consolidated, consolidated in, in one place. And yeah, also special thanks to Jason. He initiated this idea and also gave many suggestions for the final framework. And this this, uh, this slide gives some key concepts to help you know the following discussions. So basically, the uh, here we use the VFL as an example. Basically, the most important context is IMMFD. This is a container for holding multiple IO address spaces for the user application. After the IMMF, IMMF, IO MMU is created uh, by opening the slash dev slash MMU. The first step is to build the collection between VFL and MMFD. This is you know, by call, calling the bind, the uh, uh, bind operation. So basically, the bind will put the device into a security context. VFL will make the user access to the device is not allowed until the bind is completed. Um, Baudu will talk more about this. You know, 
how to guarantee this secure access at, uh, for, for the binary. Uh, once the band uh, completed, uh, the MMFD, each band device is tracked in the MMFD. This device could be a physical device, could be a MDIV with optional passive. And also at the band time, the URL space can provide a cookie to mark the device when receiving event such as IO page 4 event from the kernel. Uh, after binding is completed, the URL space can use the device gate info to query the MMU related format and the capability information for each device. And then the URL space can choose to create IO address space. When an IO address space is created, the user need to specify the format information for the underlying IO page table. The most, uh, the first uh, important thing is uh, where the IO page table is managed. The, uh, the one is the kernel managed page table that's managed by the IMMU core layer. This is the model and also what the current uh, V file provides. In the future, we will also support the user managed IO page table based on listed translation. This is necessary to enable uh, uh, guest shared virtual addressing. And moving forward, there's also, also other usages, such as to share a page table from another subsystem with MMU. For example, we can share a, a two page table of the MM uh, with MMU, or even share with the uh, uh, EBT. That's another intended usage. And uh, when also when this translation is is required, this also need to specify what's the parent IO address space information. Once the IO address space is created, the next step is to attach a device to the IO, IO address space. This uh, VFL will specify which device is attached and also optionally provide the passive information if there are multiple address spaces supported on this device. Based on this, uh, uh, based on the attached information, IOMMFD will install the IO page table to the MMU core layer, to the MMU hardware, to activity to activate this IO address space. Then, once everything is, is established, the last step is to manage the IO address space based on the type. For example, if it's a kernel managed, then just use the VFL equivalent map on map command, or in the support a user managed page table, it may use the IOTRB invalidation protocol to, up, to, to update the uh, mapping. And also there will be a fault handling command uh, to, to, uh, uh, between the user and the kernel. Yeah, basically this is uh, the key, uh, some, some key concept before we move. Any um, questions in this slide? Yeah, one question, Kevin. Um, so when you say user managed, uh, are you referring to the stage one translations? Uh, yes, yeah, stage one. Like okay. Okay, got it. Yeah. I think just while we have this slide up, it's uh, maybe I'll share how I kind of view things. The This really is shaping up to be a, a subsystem, not unlike DRM or, or RDMA that it's really about taking a piece of hardware and allowing user space to talk to it directly or efficiently, very efficiently without a kernel bypass. Like when we talk about user managed page tables, that's a piece of user space memory that the IOMMU hardware is gonna effectively DMA from and, and talk to directly. Uh, and things like invalidation of the IOTLB, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we're gonna have uh, approaches that don't need a kernel translation to do that. Um, so I think it's really important to see it in kind of that view. It, it, the other half is that it's supposed to provide a very generic interface that, that things can use to access these features that work on all of our platforms and all of our hardware. Yes. So that, uh, that's why this framework is all for the password device for the URL space. For kernel, they still follow the current uh, DMA API, the, the, the well-established mechanism. So here is a rough 
task split for all the features we have been discussed so far. Currently, we are working on the basic skeleton, and the first version just uh, sent out in last weekend. We already received uh, many great comments from uh, from Jason and Helix, and welcome to uh, to to take a look. Basically, this skeleton only supports VFL, support the uh, only PC device, and provide VFL type one V two in equivalent mapping semantics. Once this skeleton is completed, the tasks can be split into several categories. Most of them can be, uh, you know, worked on in parallel. And the first one is to move the remaining Wi-Fi devices, to film, including the software MDL, including devices on PowerPC platform, the platform device, and also a special group, you know, you know category that's for device want the non super DMA. This requires a special contract with KVM for at least for inter platform. I'm mean, still discussing with Jason about whether this will apply to other architecture. Yes. Up all the device types are moved. Then we can convert via the MMU type one driver into a CM driver. That's the last step. This is completed. We will will always use this new framework. Yeah. And here here there's one open I want to discuss here is before we create, you know, make a type one as a CM layer. Actually there's a within this transition phase, we have two drivers, both providing the same same semantics. One is the VFL type one, why one is this, you know, MMFD, within MMFD. So definitely we don't want to duplicate code because the related code is more than 2,000 line of code. So, but, but I'm curious, you know, whether you any suggestion how we want to share it. Do we want to keep the type one driver and then have MMFD to call into the VFL or we just move code to MMFD and have VFL to call the MMFD or just put it in a, another place out of both you know, the region. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm hoping there are various fixes and improvements that you would make to the type one code that would make it easier to re-implement it in the dev IMMU code so that we just stop using it over time. So, so we would have some mm -hmm. period where there's duplicated code, but, um, I'm a little afraid of just ripping it out and using it as is that it's going to stay as broken as it currently is. So, so, so does it make sense that we first split the 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 mapping related logic out of into a new file under under V file, and then when we add MMFT, we just move this file to MMFT. Would that uh, you know make this uh, transition simpler? Well, I I would see maybe. Two two possible end games here. Mm -hmm. One is that it's kind of what you what you suggest. Maybe that the VFIO code is just a shim. So when we get a VFIO ioctal, it translates it to an internal IOMMUFD ioctal effectively. Um, that that has some nice that has some nice properties, right? It gives us just one data type right. in the kernel. Everything's kind of very very simple. Uh, another end game would be where we basically take out the data structure that's holding the software page table and synchronizing it with the domain and put that in like some kind of library and the, the two things consume it. In this case, we don't end up with one data structure or we don't end up with one IO page table object in the kernel. We still have the VFIO version of it and we still have yeah, the for, IO for, version. Yeah, for the first, first option, you know, if we make it a shim, at the current state, we need to solve all, all you know, make all those device types move to use MMFD, right? That may make the skeleton require more time. We're blocking other tasks. tasks. So may, maybe I prefer to still do the, maybe as you said. Well, but this is but why I this is why I said yeah. end game, right? The end game. Where do we yeah, want to end, end game, up? Right. So how yeah. how do we get there is a slightly different question. So if you can see a technical yeah. solution where the end game is we only have I O M M U F D, and inside the kernel there's some thin translation layer. 
you know, that guides, I think, how we get there. But if you say, you know, there's some reason why I can't do that, some weird thing about the VFIO API that we just can't shim, mm -hmm. maybe we don't even try. Yeah, okay. That's it. I, I, I know your point. That was, and if somebody will think about this one. Yeah. So this is the first category. The second one is definitely just to, you know, move VDP to also use the new MMA. The next one is there will be some new device types, right? The most important one might be other MDIV or subdiv with PANSI support. Um, another important category is user managed page table. For this one, basically there are three subtypes. One is to support the nested translation, iOS is nested. Second is passive virtualization and next uh, at IO page fault. Of course, for for passive virtualization, naturally just based on this discussion with Jason, this one should only up to the virtualization case with the VMMU. If we talk about the Eurospace driver, uh, there's no need of passive virtualization. We may need another mechanism to manage the passive that just within the kernel. That's another task we really need to end. And for passive virtualization, based on different uh, vendor, it's also, you know, um, difference for, for ARM AMD and also for Intel with in command or without in command. I don't want to expand those details, but those are some, you know, further tasks, tasks we need to develop. The last, last category is a catch-all category for all uh, miscellaneous tasks that people have been discussed uh, before. Is the uh, software listing. If we don't have hardware listing, but we may still implement software listing, this can still allow us to, you know, do the centralized uh, accounting of locked uh, pages. The second one is IO page fault. Uh, some people already, you know, actually have some patch for VFL to do on demand paging just in the kernel, but uh, it's also blocked. After the new skeleton is ready, this effort can be revised. Another one is, for example, some vendors now support the MMU hardware to repeat. This can be also integrated with the net migration flow. And talk about the shared IO page table. And the last one is, you know, just in the KVM forum, MD actually support the hardware assisted virtual MMU. Suppose this framework should be fit for them to further extend. So, so anyway, it's a, it's a long list. And I, I think, um, in the end, you, you don't need the community <laughs> collaboration. Any tasks can be done in parallel. So we really look forward you know, to the, the, the collaboration in the community to accelerate this progress once the skeleton is finished. Currently, our full time, our full time is still spent on the skeleton. We hope this can be you know, as early as possible, and then other tasks can be started earlier. And there's so, some questions in yeah, yeah, regarding the collaboration. Uh, is there any alias or anything like where people can reach out uh, <clears throat> if if they want to contribute and help with some of the tasks? Yeah, we can just uh, just discuss in many lists, right? If you are interested in any task, you just uh, send a mail, then 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 just just work on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hey, K hey Karen. Uh, I have a question hey. regarding the hardware assist of the IMU. And uh, could you explain a little bit about that? I mean, just briefly. Yeah, it's sort of, yeah. It's, I, I, you may saw that presentation from, from MD, right? They actually can assign. They, they, they sort of like a SR, they have the virtual function uh, VMMU in hardware. You can assign the VMMU to a guest, so you don't need to trap the invalidation request, right? Some high acceleration from the hardware. Mm -hmm. So does it sound like we, we're going to expand the IMMU FD uh, to support such feature in? Uh, I, 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 yeah, I haven't uh, think about how, how to extend MMFD, MMFD for this task. <laughs> This is, that's just mm -hmm. the one new item I, I realized re recently. But uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we can discuss offline. <laughs> we still have some other open ones here. Okay. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you can say it's a long list. For every task, there may be 
some design open, <laughs> we can we, we can spend a lot of time. Yeah. Okay. I, I so so the next one I will give to my colleague uh, Bao Lu. I will introduce how to manage the user initiates DMA. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. So uh, uh, so. Mm, for, uh, for, for a pass-through uh, device, uh, we need to build a sec secure context uh, once the device is uh, assigned to the user access. So, uh, so the secure context should be kept until the device is, uh, is returned by the user to the kernel. <clears throat> so, uh, so first, uh, so we define, we, we define the uh, secure, uh, secure context uh, as uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the the uh, the user uh, initiated the DMA can only comes to, comes to or come to the process memory or the, uh, the 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 devices in the same group, and also we need to guarantee the exclusive DMA ownership on the group. So device in the group must be bound to the owner driver uh, uh, or the uh, 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 all the all the drivers uh, 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 that that is, is DMA safe or it, or it is driverless. So actually, for IMMU F, uh, FD design, uh, we can copy what the VF, VF, VFIO does today, <clears throat> but there uh, there is one exception. So we needed so for IMMU FD, we needed to manage the secure context switch during uh, during uh, the the device is is, is managed by the user user, uh, user user level. For example, a device a device could switch I O I O address space to another one. So so during runtime. So so the, uh, currently I M U A P I has a problem uh, on this tra transition because uh, where a domain is detached. Uh, from a device, uh, the default domain will be reattached. Uh, so this is for with VFIO design. So, but but it's not uh, uh, is it it done done work for for our RMU FT uh, case. So so our idea is to to. To develop the uh, uh, to develop the user initiated DMA secure context in the IMU core, so that the upper layers, for example, the VFIO, IMMFT, or or even other VDPA framework, can use the common common uh, code for for the secure context management. Uh, Kevin, can you can you yeah the next page? So. Uh, so our, our purpose is uh, <clears throat> we 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 can uh, we we must first we must define a a API for for the upper layer to 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 tell the IMU call that a device is going to assign to the user so so the secure context should be uh, set up so uh, this API is called the IMU device. Uh, initiate a user D, uh, DMA. So on, on this slide, we we uh, we uh, um, just use the uh, device cent uh, centric uh, APIs, but we could also uh, uh, work out uh, the group centric APIs so that the v so so that so that the VFIO, uh, uh, which is group centric, could also use this API. So here we just use the uh, device centric API as an example. So when the when the device uh, bind to IMUFD, so uh, this interface will be used by the upper layer to tell IMU call that we should uh, uh, should, should should put the device and the 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 and its IM group into a secure context. And uh, uh, during runtime, so the up layer could use the attached device, detached device, or attached group, or detached uh, detached uh, group to to switch between different uh, uh, different uh, uh, secure context. Yeah. So, when, or once the user completes uh, the 
to uh, call the last API, IAM device exists user DMA to to tell the IAM call. I'm, I am I call that uh, the secure context is uh, is end. So the IAM call will uh, do some clean up uh, clean up work and also reattach the default domain to the group so that the kernel uh, kernel driver could use use the device for kernel DMA. Yeah, that is our our, our uh, proposal. Hey, Raul. Yeah, hi, Yo. Hey, uh, so the, the way it works today is that I am a new attached device and um, only works on, on devices which are in their own group. So they are the only device in their group. Otherwise, you have to use I am a attached group, I think. Um, so the dance with the with the ref count is probably not necessary, right? Or do, do I miss anything? So, 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 so the, the ref count is we just, the ref count I think is a lock, right? Device. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's a question, Yoga. We want to ask you, right? Uh, several years ago, you had a, you know, you actually changed the a test device to only work for for group with one device. Is there any reason? Currently, we, we just extended yeah, yeah, the, the, the only for but then it's still capable of range the logic. Yeah. The reason is that we have IOMU groups, and for IOMU groups, we need to make sure that every device is attached to the to the same uh, domain, right? Yeah, well, but no, here we so no, no, that's too so it, it doesn't need to make be sense. Attached. They don't need to be attached to the same domain. They just need to be attached to the same security zone, security area. Yeah, it depends on the definition of the group. So the group was defined as a group of devices where the IOMMU can't uh, differentiate be between, right? In that case, yeah, then the group is the, the thing that's and, attached to, but there's the other group definition. Of, that's not true. Yeah, right? there, there's the other definition where you say that the devices are not Really isolated between each other. So, um, if you want to lift yes. that requirement, if you want to lift the requirement that that um, every device in the group in the group has been in its own domain uh, in the same domain, um, then we might to need to split the group concept into. These are this is a group of devices which the IOMU can't differentiate between and. This is a group of devices which I, I, you can differentiate between, but which are not is, isolated um, between each other. So, 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 so you know, currently we extend, we lift this restriction only if the group is marked as user DMA. That means it's already called with this API. So, for the normal group, they are still follow your original re restriction, because once we have this extension in place. We MMU can MFD can be fully device centric. You don't need to maintain any logic, right? They can greatly okay. simplify the implementation there. It still needs to know about the, the thing that the first thing Jorg was talking about, where we can't the IMU cannot match a device. It just can't. The, the hardware can't do it. Uh, uh, sorry, just I didn't get. There's still the case where the hardware cannot discriminate between devices and groups. Like it physically cannot give you different IO page yeah. tables for different devices. And we need to you know, we need to manage that in some way. Yeah, for that we just have detection within attached device, right? If you want to attach devices to different domain, then the second attach will fail. But we don't need to you know well no I, the, yeah. I think the way, we... no I mean I, I think the way I was thinking of handling this is you can still attach an, an IO page table to a device, but the low level code now says if that device is aliased with another device in terms of what IO page tables it can match, the attachment will fail if it's not attaching the same IO page table. That gives user space a lot of flexibility in how to use this and, and, and doesn't force us to make a very group centric interface for this edge case. Yeah, that that might be a case, uh, and uh, at this at this stage we we have have we choose a sim uh, simple way. So we 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 just allow the 
uh, a single uh, domain for the for the devices in a uh, IMM group. So if if we want to support uh, uh, multiple domains for 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 uh, IMM group, maybe we 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 will fix such issues. I mean, that makes sense as a starting point, and, and kind of keep it the way I said, where the first device to, to attach sets the domain for the group, and then all the other devices have to follow. And if we can do better later, then we can, re, you know, further relax it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I agree. But but there might be some uh, hardware limitations. For example, the PCI allies. So for that, we maybe need to fill if the devices in, uh, which are allied for PCI SID, we, we, need, we must force the use of a, a same IME domain. Yeah, yeah that's, what, that I, that's case, what I said. Yeah, right. in that case, maybe we can have some subgroup concepts, right? Only when hardware allows, we can have some subgroup, recent group. But, but anyway, there's yeah, a future no, extension. Yeah, that's but so when I, when, I think about, when I think about PCI, then, then um, the the groups which are or the devices which are grouped together be, because they're not they are not isolated between each other there are two cases um, which is uh, sub functions of a, of a, a PCIe device and uh, devices which are not behind an ACS capable bridge or where ACS is not enabled. So if for if for standard IO MMU groups we lift the requirement about the ACS. Um, and move that into, say, VFIO groups or um, UFD groups or, or whatever we, we, we call it, that would split it up and move that um, that complexity out of the IOMU core into um, the layers who actually care about this. Would that be an idea? Yeah, I think that's the way to, to go. And I, I wanted to ask, does anyone use this today? Like, can this even be accessed? If if I had a an non ACS capable switch, could I assign two different I/O page tables, two devices, two different yeah. devices? Yeah. As the code is implemented today, no, this doesn't work. So this, we're, what we're I, really I, talking I, about I, here is adding more functionality, and uh, you know, yeah, that I, can I, go later. Annex has a Annex has a off three patch to lift the ACS registration, but upstream. That was entirely a hack that is yeah, yeah. overused by people in the community. But I mean, if we don't have a use case for it, it doesn't have to really block things. We just need to get things to where they kind of are today. And if today is one IO page table per IOMMU group, then that's what just where we need to get to to get things you know, equivalent in moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, we can follow this state. Uh, there are, there's a real demand. <laughs> okay. If no, no more question about this night, then the last one is some, some other opens related to the current implementation. I mean, the first one, I, I already have some discussion with Jason, but want to have a border alignment here. No, I think there's a the, the main problem is there's a naming conflict, right? Earlier we uh, we said that we use IOS to describe the FD local software handles to represent the IO, IO address space, but within kernel now there is actually IOS also used to represent the hardware address space ID such as the that uh, substream ID. So you know, just wonder how how we want to better differentiate them in this case. Yeah, earlier Jason said that uh, we can use IOS the underscore ID for software handle and continue to use IOS for the hardware handle. I'm not sure whether others also agree that you know there's no confusion with this. Yeah. I think the the IO IOAS underscore ID, if you do it that way, then it's restricted to the IO mmufd.c file and it's only used as an input to an x-ray lookup so it's it's extremely constrained but once we start to support a passage right passage is allocated with some ios the underscore and function from this file that caused some confusion 
well, it's IO ACID without the underscore. So it's, I mean, it's not a perfect disambiguation, but <laughs> it is where we are. Yeah, I, I, but we can't we can follow this one if you know, and if no no other option from other people, yeah, just uh, quick 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 up brainstorming here. Yeah, if no more comments, maybe 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 we can settle it uh, in the mail discussion in case people have other idea after this meeting. The second open is already so related to the name, right? Currently, we call this feature as MMFD. I think it's not, not <laughs> anything opened with FD can be opened with FD with the DV node, such as wave file is a virtual function IO. That's the abbreviation. But uh, how to call this feature? And we happen to say that, you know, 10 years ago before wave file has a container, uh, actually there is a, they call that as a UMMU and uh, use dev slash UMMU. I'm not sure whether, you know, you guys think the later the later one might be a bit for this feature or any other I think, options. I think if IOMU is, is totally fine because when it's a it's, it's a device file, this implies it's a user space interface. So you don't need to express it in the in the name again. So if IOMU is fine with me. I like it. You mean too. the former? The the former one? Yeah. Then, then for example, we within the kernel, the key config. How how do we want to call this feature? There, there's a That's long a, history in the kernel of calling things something something FD, like timer FD, event FD, uh, right? Okay, so so, ring so, FD. So, so the, the, the cake config is fine. Fun. Yeah, okay, I, don't, I okay. wouldn't overthink okay. it. Okay. Uh, the third one is the hierarchy. I think for this one, we will, we already get a good suggestion from Jason. Earlier in current, uh, you know, if you see our V1 patch, Actually, we just uh, you know put the device name from any bus just uh, in the same directory, but this actually potentially can cause the conflict. And uh, Jason suggested that maybe we can just create a starting node called uh, device zero, device one, device two, and then link this node to the CSFS path for this device. Then for the euro space such as Qmu. It can you know check the CSFS path and then identify which uh, node under dev dev file devices should be used. And this is the current thinking that we 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 thought that that's a good model, but just uh, you know in case anyone has different different thinking for this one, or or Jason you you may want to it if I didn't describe it clearly. Oh, I just suggested just using integers. Like we don't actually need to encode the the bus information here. It's already available yeah. through SysFS. Okay, so you know, all, all those are quick quick points to close. The, maybe the last one is, finally, do we want to build MML FD as a separate module? And also, do we want to place this within the driver drivers slash MMU and move it out, out of there? Do you have an idea? Yeah, I think there's no reason it could, I think there's no reason it could not be a module, right? A separate module which is then used by VFAO and BTPA. Yeah. So I think that's that makes most sense. Uh, uh, uh sorry, uh which makes most sense? Uh having it as a separate as a separate module. Okay. So and also so, move out, out of move out of the MMU subsystem, put it in a new directory, <clears throat> or I, I would put um, it as no, a separate. Yeah, yeah, right. Drivers MMU, MMU FT or something. Um, yeah, but make it compatible as as a module. So because all the users are modules too, and um, if someone don't don't want to use it, then it just doesn't load the module. So. So yeah. that it's just loaded as a dependency for other modules. Right. It, it's a pretty long-standing tradition to keep user interfaces in their own modules. That way, if you know, for security reasons, some system doesn't want to have that that UAPI exposure, they can just not load the module. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Just just a, just a one open. So if we build it as a separate separated module, so. So, for example, when we have I want to call some in, some uh, helpers in the IMFD, so maybe it will use 
uh, you use something like the get symbol to 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 check whether the module has been loaded. So will that be a problem? Shouldn't normal module dependencies handle that? I don't know. You'd have to point us at a specific instance where we actually need to check for a symbol. Yeah. Yeah, you should rely on normal module dependencies as much as possible. Like don't do simple get things and don't worry about like don't worry about it. That's what they're for. If if you call MMUFD stuff from VFIO, that's perfectly fine. Right. With this interface, VFI will become dependent on IMFT mean, loaded. So it's not it's not the same dependency that we were trying to work around between, for instance, VFI and KVM. Right. I didn't I never really liked that <laughs> that weird coupling with VF, with KVM. But yeah, I would uh, I would advise against it here. Kevin, uh, Lou, I think you have three minutes left in this session. Please, if there is anything else you want to discuss, please go ahead. I mean, uh, try to wrap it up shortly. Thank you. Yeah, I think we, we have finished all the opens. So, so, so uh, uh, Jason, do you, do you have anything you want to quick discuss based on the current review status? Um, I thought, uh... You know, I thought it, it showed that the approach could look really clean in code for the most part, right? Like there was nothing, mm -hmm. it, it's a shame we didn't see how the moving the the type one code would look, but I think, you know, I'm willing to believe that there's a way to do that nicely. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it really suggested that the first series should be lowering the group interlock logic out of VFIO and putting it in the, IOMMU core correctly, properly, yeah, yeah. and then deleting all of that, the, the sort of supporting code that, that's all over the place for that. Um, I know Christoph, Christoph had taken an attempt at deleting it and it didn't, it didn't work out because he didn't have a solution for the bug on, but I think we can get rid of the bug on, which will make everybody happier and then just delete all of it. Okay. Uh, and that, that's yeah, like we will work on that as the first task. It is then resume the, 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 the skeleton. Yeah. And yeah, making the VFIO into a struct device is, is pretty straightforward. I, I'll send you something of what that's supposed to look like. And I noticed that you copied the group code to do what you did, and I went and sat down and cleaned up the group code yesterday. So okay. there's something that to look at. That would be very helpful. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jason. So, so no, I think uh, I'm finished. Well, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Kevin and Lou, for the very interesting discussion. I mean, looking forward to following it up on my list. I think we have um, coming up a five minute break. We start again uh, 35 past the hour with the last presentation from Ashok on opens on uh, PCI, Linux PCI features.
Sorry guys for the poll, I'm a bit biased. So, um, Ashok, I'm handing over to you uh, for the last topic of this presentation, uh, of this session, sorry, of the MC. Um, I'll make you a presenter now, so we should be all set. Right, <clears throat> thanks Lorenzo. It's over to you, thank you very much. All right. Um, it's always nervous being the last topic of the day. It's between me and uh, the weekend hitting us. So um, I'll try to wrap this up as soon as possible. Um, so I didn't have a big uh, list of uh, you know presentation or anything for this one. Just want to kind of bring up um, some of the issues that I think exist on um, the Linux PCI, you know, handling of certain things. Um, and you know, just want to kind of have an open discussion on some of these topics and, and you know, maybe pick up the ones of high priority or more interest um, for working it through the mailing list as we go along. Um, so the first one on my list was um, how we handle, you know, MPS today. Um, and uh, the key issue that I had in mind was when we have um, a device that's through the hierarchy and we know that uh, the maximum MPS uh, between the root port and the endpoint um, is, 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 is identified, the kernel can set up the largest um, setting for MPS uh, through the path for the maximum for the best performance, right? Um, but when a new device gets inserted in the same hierarchy that isn't capable of the maximum MPS that was configured for the path, um, I'm not too sure if uh, we in Linux actually do this correctly, or even if we do anything at all actually at the moment. Um, that was one of the uh, one of the issues I was um, thinking. Um, if there needs to be more robust handling of uh, of devices that are hot plugged uh, for an, from an MPS um, perspective. Beyond, if you're there, or um, I don't know if anybody else is there on the hot plug PCI side. Um, yeah, I'm here. I don't have a good answer for you. I mean, I've, I, this is definitely a problem area, and I would welcome some cleanup in this. It's kind of it's kind of a mess currently because I think we configure this after we enumerate all the devices, so it's not a per device enumeration sort of thing. Right. And it's intertwined with MRRS as well. So, Correct. yeah, it definitely needs work. Yeah, I think the easiest, you know, handling we can probably do is, you know, if the device is less than what is already configured in the path, we could at least, you know, at the minimum, maybe fail its hot plug um, stuff. Or I'm not sure about the, what the spec says, but if the um, if we set the MRRS at and the MPS at the <laughs> lowest level, um, I believe the root port is supposed to honor that actually, and maybe it'll be compatible actually without necessarily failing the entire uh, path. Um, 
reconfiguring the whole thing becomes really messy because we need to coerce all the devices and re, you know, stop everything and restart everything. Um, and that might also drop the performance on other already previously attached hierarchy that has a higher MPS setting. So right. um, yeah, do, doing, doing right. something. Go ahead. So uh, there's, you know, you mentioned coercing all the devices, which is, is true that I think would have to be done to reconfigure the hierarchy. Um, that's, I think the, um, uh, what do you call it? The bar reassignment work that was posted a year, year and a half ago, I think has similar functionality. So there's possibly some overlap with that, but that hasn't really gone over yet. Right. Yeah, I think, and, and if it's not compatible, we can always punish the low performing device and say, you know, I'm not able to hot plug because, you know, the current settings are not compatible, actually. Um, they might need to go through reboot or fix it in the next cycle to, um, right. to minimum, uh, minimum damage, actually. Um, yeah, I would, I would think that probably we would want to enumerate the device, just, but just prevent a driver from binding to it so that you could still right. look at it via LSPCI and whatnot. Exactly, exactly. I think that's the first, you know, poor man solution, then we can improve it as we go along. Um, the next one is, is more interesting, and I'm not, uh, and I'm not 100%, um, you know, familiar with the topic yet. But um, one of the issues was that when we take things from, you know, um, the five bit default um, a a tagging to eight bit, and then extend it back to um, the 10 bit, um, the impression that I had was that once you have configured the path, it has the same property as what we do for MPS, but when extended tagging is enabled, um, and if the device is not compatible with that uh, with that extended tag, I wasn't sure if even probe actually works or not, or if that will result in completion timeouts. Um, I was under the impression that maybe the spec would only dictate that for uh, for data transactions and for normal config cycles, you know, limited to the, uh, the, the default, you know, smaller sized one for compatibility. Uh, but it seems like the spec is not uh, necessarily stated that way. Um, so this is, you know, at least in the MPS side, we can punish the new, new hot added device. Uh, but I'm not sure if there are any ideas about how to treat extended tagging. I think Linux doesn't today care about uh, the 10-bit tag yet. I think the only thing we do is the 8-bit um, the tag, which is just enabling the extended um, tagging capability. The 10-bit has its own opt-in, which I believe nobody has enabled it yet. I think there are some proof There's some patches in the list for that. Oh, OK. So, um, okay. And that's been posted for a while, so there's a good chance we'll be able to merge it this cycle, I would think. Excellent. Okay, and I think the, um, I'm, I'm assuming that then it wouldn't still um, have any handling for the uh, the hot added um, device case, actually, when when it is not supporting the, the, the enhanced tagging that you've enabled now throughout the path. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look at the spec again. I thought that it was defined in such a way that, well, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, we'd have to explore that some more. All right. Um, and Linux also today for TCVC mapping, I believe the only thing we do is um, we just save and restore during, you know, normal suspend resume operations. Um, we don't necessarily manage um, that mapping in the kernel space. Um, typically, I think you now the BIOS sets things up and we just, you know, keep it the same uh, during uh, state save operations. Um, is there some, is, should we actually do more about what the kernel does in, uh, in trying to manage the mapping itself, actually more so than not depending on the BIOS itself for this? I hear crickets. So, um, yeah, that's because I'm looking up what TC and VCR. So, <laughs> obviously, I have no answer for you. 
there are right. very few devices that have VCs at all. I mean, there might be some out there, but it's certainly very rare. Right, right. I was thinking about Jonathan for CXL, if it has uh, some implications, but I cannot remember out off the top of my head. Not that we can talk about. One of those. The save and restore of these came about because of uh, GPUs mostly and the firmware settings for that, but I, I have no idea how you decide what channel mappings to use. Yeah, I think DCIX it, used to use them a lot, but nothing's quite got upstream for that that would not be BIOS set up anyway. I see. I think the default mapping is mandatory. If it exists, then you know uh, the PC0 to VC0 mapping is, is always there. But how we handle the non-zero mappings, um, if more than one PC is available, is, is something that um, we might need to enlighten. But I think the question is like, how do we do that? Maybe you know, getting a good device example. Um, from any of the device vendors that need that thing would be useful, actually. Um, the next one I had was um, the flattening portal bridge. Apparently, I heard that at least the new um, Tiger Lake systems are capable of, um, of using this feature. It kind of um, makes a lot of the resource assignments a lot easily manageable from the OS side um, by not requiring to pre-allocate all the bus numbers and all the, also the memory space uh, requirements. Um, I'm not sure if I have, you know, maybe I missed it. Actually, no. Um, Bjorn, do you, do you, have you seen any patches or any support for FPB at all actually on Linux yet? No, I haven't. Not that I remember anyway. Okay. Um, other other operating systems apparently support this uh, is, is what I hear actually, but you know, um, I have not heard any request from device vendors either. But um, this is an upcoming topic, at least starting the new Tiger Lake platforms and. Uh, um, and possibly will you know uh, drop into servers to actually mostly on you know devices that support Thunderbolt and other things where uh, you your fan out is increasing. Um, in the past, actually, all the pre-reserved bus numbers for routing is um, is extremely limiting a hot plug aspect. So FPV was supposed to alleviate that, so you can have non-contiguous ranges and still be able to route them through by dynamically managing that um, that routing ID from the OS side action. Um, last so one, sort of, yeah, go ahead. Partly solving the resource rebalancing issues, and we one of the reasons that we haven't really gone anywhere with that is is that there's not been a lot of demand for it. I mean, I don't see bugzillas, I don't see requests from distros, whatnot. So, you know, I, I think FPB right. seems like it's sort of in the same situation. It's it's a solution for sure, but it's not clear that we have the problem that it solves yet. Right. I think the the target was, you know, um, uh, devices like Thunderbolt, where you can have, you know, expansions showing up really fast and the the scale out happening, and by pre-reserving them, you you kind of prevent that that capability. Um, I I know that at least the host side actually has this capability. I don't know about any. Um, discrete uh, PCI switches or or even built-in switches that actually support that capability yet. Um, maybe that's why yeah. there is not a big request actually for it. It's definitely a you know a, a potential problem. It's just that I don't see the evidence in terms of people complaining about the problem yet. So right. that right. would help to motivate either FPV or the rebalancing patches. Correct. 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 Are we going to have a potential problem if a BIOS is set up? FPV and we then look at it and have no idea what's going on. What was it, Jonathan? I, I didn't catch if, that. If, if we've got a, a BIOS as pre-enumerated stuff and decided to use the flattening stuff, are we um, going to ignore it? I've been sort of vaguely wondering what on earth happens. Well, the BIOS setup for the, the default one is different, but when you hot add it, you need to add the new resource into, that, um, into the FPV uh, config space. Um, to make sure that they can now route for the new device, right? That's that's yeah, Th that's where the OS part comes in. Okay. Even though it can be pre-configured, uh, but that's not solving the um, the hot plug issue. Um, the last one I, I, I know Linux has some solution for resizable bars today, which obviously all the graphics devices use, um, but 
but it's a request from the device driver to say, hey, Norm, can you do this thing? Um, I think obviously the number of users are very limited, I guess, just only in the, um, only the graphics community uh, at the moment. Um, but I wasn't sure if this is uh, motivation to actually, you know, remove that uh, requirement from the device driver calling for it versus uh, the PCI core, you know, um, being able to manage and support the, the resizable bar stuff. Um, so what, uh, what are you thinking there? We would just resize, as, resize it to as big as we have space for, or? Yes. Yeah, I think that's always the, the, the best uh, for performance reasons, right? So if we, can, if we can find that the root port is able to accommodate that size, although the default bar size may be smaller because that's what the card comes up with for compatibility, uh, we could provide out of box solution by, by just you know, finding the maximum supported one. And if we have room, Let's go fix it up during the, the, the probe time itself and, and resize the bar. The devices I've seen supporting this put that, that they support everything in the right. supported bar sizes. So you're going to be enabling petabyte bars for no reason. Uh, but would it, it be the same? I mean, the device, OK. Um, I, I think there's currently a, a driver dependency there that the driver knows what the device can actually make use of. I see. I see that. Okay. Okay. So th if the driver thinks that even though he supports petabyte, but if eight meg is good enough, he would probably just stick with that rather than. Um, right. For a GPU, you know, they'll, they'll boot with 256 meg bars for compatibility, but they might only go up to the RAM size that's installed on that particular SKU of the device. Makes sense. Okay, I think in that case, it probably is best um, the way it is right now. So we, let's put the, uh, the, the request of the driver to actually choose the right size. That makes sense. Another issue with the current uh, solution is that uh, these GPUs that want a big bar Frequently, the post bridge description does not expose a window that's big enough. So I think the drivers do some fiddling with the, um, you know, some processor specific configuration or to find out what's available or to reconfigure it or something. So it's outside the dis ACPI description of the windows. And right. I think you're right. So if if the configuration is not uh, correctly done in the root port, there is nothing the driver can, the OS can even do to go resize it. Um, so there yeah. needs to be some out of band mechanism to actually tell the BIOS or the system agent to say like, now go, go make this bigger. <clears throat> and then on the next reboot, you know, things are now um, rightly sized. Um, yeah, I think they, I think BIOS is like, avoid windows that cross the four gig boundary and there's missing support in terms of you know we we don't have a way to resize those windows we don't support srs on host bridge windows for instance so yeah there's i think a few things there that are complicating factors uh, that, that's what i've wished to see on that is some sort of way to uh, ask the pci subsystem to allocate larger windows for specific devices when the BIOS doesn't support resizable bars and and then the driver is just stuck. Yep, yep, yep. And, you know, we, we also discussed it in the platform sense, you know, if, uh, like, you know, for one of the RAS features we worked on in the past, uh, there was a way to communicate, um, um, for instance, like, you know, only certain address ranges are mirrored, for instance, in the system. And we had a way for, um, the, the kernel to actually tell the buyer saying, no, I, I want you to put X percentage of memory in a mirrored range. Um, we, if there is some facility like that, we could at least, you know, instruct the BIOS and say like, you know, go do this on the next reboot. And then when you reboot and come back up, you can, you can check what the size is. Um, and now you might be at the right size, actually, if the BIOS supported that, uh, that API. Um, other than that, I think it's just a manual game that the administrator needs to play to make sure that this is correctly set um, before it can proceed. Makes sense. Okay. If, if, my, if my previous statement about the device 
exposing all sorts of bar sizes is true, then BIOSes might have the same issue that Linux does in automatic enabling it. They need device specific support to know what size to create those windows. So we might see uh, aperture size problems all sorts of places unless the vendor has specifically qualified that GPU on that system. Correct, correct. I think the BIOS needs to be you know, aware of support for what kind of cards and what size it is based on its um, memory. Um, and that might need to happen within the BIOS you know, pre-configure space before they can, um, they can boot. That's, there's very little I think the OS can actually do to, to make this smoother action. Yep, makes sense. Those are the topics I had. You know, I, I have some patches for the MPS handling part, um, and you know, I'll, I'll try to take a look at that and also look at the um, the ten bit tagging that um, that Bjorn mentioned actually also uh, offline. Um, anything else that people see in the PCI space that we need to um, focus on? I'm not sure it's something we can really address in any detail, but I have had a few requests recently for kernel folks to get a bit more involved earlier in PCI, adding stuff to the spec. Right, right. So beyond encouraging people to do so, I don't know if there's any other actions we could take. Yeah, we, we try to do that at least, you know, I mean, um, and, and, and some of the specs at least, I think, you know, um, Ben has been involved in trying to create some few new models and creating that whole infrastructure before the spec is done. Otherwise, PCI always has the, um, the audacity to go create the spec before an implementation, and then we are stuck with something that's not workable for a long time. Um, yeah, I mean, the, all of the restrictions on talking about it do make it awfully hard to yep. collaborate on this stuff. Um, yep. And as you say, yeah, Ben's work's been great for CXL. Um, exactly. I mean, yeah, my, my, my vision long term is that we implement everything before the spec's published, but in the emulation at least, but we can't talk about it in public. Exactly. That's that's the limiting factor. With that, the spec development is not in open, so you know you have to be hush hush and there's only little uh, people can do <laughs> um, with, yep. with, with, with closed uh, closed settings. So um, no, absolutely. I wish open it up. Yeah. I mean, it may be as simple as we look for an avenue to at least agree amongst those who are active that someone looks at a given chunk of the spec, even if we haven't Absolutely. got time to, yep. to go yep. in, in detail. Sounds good. Otherwise, and I don't have any other open uh, topics here, Enzo. Um, any last minute request for people in this conference while we are in the same virtual room I, I didn't decide to show myself up because i'm completely dressed in covid attire <laughs> so thanks, thanks Lawrence, I, for doing this. i think this has been a great uh great, great conference thank you i was very interesting um, all of the topics and thank you uh, very much for uh, presenting um yes so i think uh it went really fast at least for me uh, to wrap it up well I, first of all i want to thank uh, everybody who helped organizing it christoph for uh, the logistics and everything he did and uh, alex bjorn and york for agreeing to have this to having this um, MC again this year, which was very interesting in my opinion, very productive. So I really encourage everyone to follow up discussions on uh, in Aki rooms. I mean, there are topics that I'm obviously involved with, but I mean, the others uh, as well. I mean, uh, to encourage discussion on mailing list and patch set. Um, I think I want to thank all the presenters for giving very nice presentations and explaining the problems they are solving very well. And uh, to wrap it up, I really wish next year to meet you all in person because what we are missing is basically talking, well, I mean, these discussions offline when the conference uh, wraps up, which is part of plum, usual plumbers, but I mean, we are losing it with the virtual experience, even though it was very positive anyway, in my opinion, for the second year running. So 
uh, to complete, I mean, just thank you very much all for attending, for your useful presentations and comments. And I mean, I'll talk to you in L within LPC tomorrow. I mean, and uh, well, uh, online or offline, I mean, feel free to reach out through the usual channels if anything uh, needs attention. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, it, was a uh, it was a pleasure to run this microconference. Thank you very much on behalf of everyone organizing it. Thanks, Lorenzo. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks, Lorenzo and everyone.